feeling stuck? Why not try Magic and the Occult at magic.me, the world's greatest school for magic, meditation, and mysticism. When all else fails, there's always the dark arts. M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. Well, not so dark, but uh, definitely arts, and the world is dark enough as it is. Magic can liberate you. It can bring you success in whatever it does, whatever it is that you do in your life. Combined with yoga and meditation, which I also teach, they can fill you with inner bliss, joy, contentment, and happiness beyond anything, and I say this without exaggeration, anything that you can buy in the entire consumer landscape. Nothing you can get anywhere will give you as much happiness as an advanced meditation practice. And the place to learn that, magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. Okay, returning to the podcast for I think the third time is my great friend Mickey Pellerano, who I've known forever. He is an artist working in the Western esoteric tradition and has for a long time. He does great stuff, MickeyPellerano.com. He also hosts the new show Time Lord, which you can find on YouTube, which is also a cult interviews, but on video with like awesome set decoration. Definitely check it out, TimeLord.tv. We're talking about Dion Fortune and the mystical Kabbalah in this podcast. So following on from different experimental formats we've been trying, we did the Mitch Horowitz podcast where we were talking about the Dark Knight, and I think people really, really liked that one. So I'm going to keep going with that format, um, and but we may also be talking about books. I think that talking about classic occult books, ones that people tend to know that they start with, is a really good idea. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the book, The Mystical Kabbalah by Dion Fortune. It was published in the 30s. It tends to be the first book that people go to when they start learning the Kabbalah or Western mysticism, Western magic, that type of thing. And so we dig into this and look at the broader context of this book and ask, should it remain a go-to text the answer may surprise you. From the back of the Mystical Kabbalah, Dion Fortune's The Mystical Kabbalah remains a classic in its clarity, linking the broad elements of Jewish traditional thought, probably going back to the Babylonian captivity and beyond, with both Eastern and Western philosophy and later Christian insights. Dion Fortune was one of the first adepts to bring this secret tradition to a wider audience. Some before her often only added to the overall mystery by elaborating on obscurity, but her account is simple clear and comprehensive. So this book is one of, I think, probably one of the most successful occult books there is. Uh, it's certainly up there, and it has remained in print for, for, for a long time through, I think it's, yeah, Wiser. And it's just one of those books that everyone reads at some point, usually early on. So let's dig in. Let's find out what is in this book and whether we should still be reading it. All right, here is Mickey. This is this is we're still in experimental mode with this. Thank you for being game to do this. So so we're starting I'm or I'm adding some a, a new type of episode to the podcast where I'm talking to somebody about a book, movie or other you know, often a pop culture book or movie, or or in this case, a classic occult book that people are very familiar with, or magical book or spiritual book, and trying to dig in a little bit deeper. So we're going to talk about The Mystical Kabbalah by Dion Fortune, which is a very, very famous book on magic, and often one of the first ones that people read when they start studying at least Western magic in a more serious fashion. So there's a lot I want to talk about with this book. I want to, I mean, but there's three overall areas I think we can dig in on. One is the book itself. One is Dion Fortune, her life, her career, her legacy, her eccentricities, shall we say. And then the third one is just Kabbalah. And I think that would be interesting to touch on as well, because not just as a magical system or a, a spiritual system, but the overall context of Kabbalah and its geopolitics and its cultural assumptions and the cultural exchange between 
Christianity and Judaism, and and there's a lot to talk about that often just does, gets brushed over entirely by people who are studying it. So we can talk about that too. But you just re, you, you you just spent some time rereading this book. So let me you just start off by asking, what were your impressions on rereading it? I imagine you probably read it quite a long time ago, but. Well, no, I actually reread it like pretty recently, maybe like during lockdown. And I remember being like, oh, whoa, you, you know how when you read a book and it's like, whoa, all these synapses kind of like fired with it. And uh, and this time, not so much. I was I was like, um, like, I remember at first when we discussed this, you were like, OK, the unfortunate, although it's a bit basic. And I was like, no, it's like heavily esoteric. And it is. But, you know, when you read stuff like that, um, when you read something that really makes it go, um, I found, uh, honestly, that it sparked more interest of Kabbalistic concepts like that were outside the book uh, than it did within. You know, What do you, what do you mean? That's interesting. Um, just in my normal way of interpreting Kabbalah and, and the tree is kind of like everything of... Uh, 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 involving astrology and tarot and magic and all kinds of traditions. And, and the reason why uh, Kabbalah and the tree are so useful to me is because they serve as a structure or as a, you know, filing cabinet or whatever for, for all this kind of information and um, almost an anchor for the contemplation of esoteric ideas or uh, mythological ideas or magical uh, uh, astrological, etc., ideas. And, um, you know, she doesn't much go into the 22 paths in the book as much. Um, there yeah, are that's, that's that she- why I mentioned the, the fo- like, we, we don't need to talk about it in this podcast, but the Gareth Knight book is the follow up where he fulfills that with the 22 paths for student. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk about paths because I think they're yeah. like super they're so fascinating and amazing and um, fruitful for uh, contemplation. For sure. And um, um, and it's a great book. Uh, Let me just uh, pause for just a second, just because I realize we didn't even say what the book is about for people who don't haven't read it before. So just, sure, sure. just to pause for a second and then go straight back to that, because we're already talking about paths and stuff. So the Mystical Kabbalah is... A fairly large book written by Dion Fortune, who is one of the most prominent occult writers of the 20th century. She was a student of the Golden Dawn as well as theosophy and Christianity and Christian science and a bunch of other stuff. And it's largely a narrative walkthrough of the 10 spheres on the Tree of Life, which is the framework of all Western magic. It's a map of, you know, the conceptual universe and is from Judaism originally, obviously, but starting with the Renaissance, like Ficino and people you're talking about, the Renaissance in particular, and then Levy and Golden Dawn and Crowley really became divorced, well, Christianized, basically, and then and then became hermeticized in the 19th century and, and ended up being used more by occult people for outside of the context of Judaism. And it still forms really the ground plan for pr- pretty much all students of, of Western magic and is just, is just one of these things that you just can't get away from if you, if you study magic. So, so when people first studying, when people first start studying Kabbalah or tarot in a deep way, they tend to read this book and it, this, what this book really is, is a narrative, narrativization of Crowley's 777 tables combined with a lot of Dion Fortune's own kind of new age channeling work which we can talk about, but just to boilerplate that. So it's kind of like the go-to textbook on Kabbalah. Yeah. And I, you know, I really don't know much about Dion Fortune's life and uh, trajectory or any of that stuff. I'm, you know, what really excites me is talking about the, the, the content, right. Of the book and the, the, the springboard of the tree and, and all the things that it evokes and all the things that it can that it uh, charges in all the ways that it can be used and the mysteries it opens up. Definitely. I, I only knew the broad outlines of Dion Fortune's life also, but I was just even just in revisiting the Wikipedia on her right before doing this interview. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that, that 
I think is really important for understanding this book in context that, that we can touch on, including, do you, you, did you know that we, we largely have Dion Fortune to thank for soy milk? Really? Yes. She's, she was an early, before she joined the Golden Dawn, she had a company to promote soy milk and wrote a book in 1925 called The Soya Bean, An Appeal to Humanitarians, and really pushed it in England. So we, we have her to thank for that, as well as, I would say, like, the broad baseline kind of British New Ager, you know, esoteric hippie culture. She really laid out a lot of that, you know, pr- you know, pr- pre-chaos magic, you know, very much in, you could compare her or very much in contradiction to Kenneth Grant, who was around at somewhat the same time, but very much, very much like the English, like white lighter, like holding hands at Glastonbury at, at dawn, that type of thing. So there's a lot we can talk about with her, but yeah, let's talk about Kabbalah as well. So my general feeling on this, and I'm curious what you think, I kind of feel about this book and Dion Fortune's work the same way I do about Israel Regardi's, which is when you first encounter it, it's like so complex and it, 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 fantastical and it's narrative at the same time. And so it forms like a very readable narrative to these subjects in the same way that people now read, you know, comics like Promethea and, and things like that. Then when you dig into it more, you realize that she's same with Riccardi. She's basically just taking data tables from Crowley and writing up descriptions around them and turning it into a book. And then in her case, and I think also in Regardi's, they layer a lot of stuff on top of it that is not in the original material. For instance, like Freudian or Reichian material, or Dion Fortune layers on all this theosophical stuff. Uh, Gareth Knight, her student, laid in Scientology as well. So they just kind of pack in all this mm. other stuff that is not, because he was a Scientologist. Um, her group later mer- was, was heavily influenced, and a lot of people were in Scientology when it was big in England in the 60s. So th- she layers in a lot of stuff. And so at that point, it becomes less interesting. But it is useful as a useful, although I would say overwhelming, perhaps as an introductory introduction to the subject, because eventually you kind of want to get to the point where you, you're just working with the material and path working on your own. And then it becomes personalized and, and her descriptions of her own path workings are not that interesting. Uh, right. And she even doesn't even reveal very much, I would say. Whereas Israel Regardi, somebody asked me recently, oh, what's a good book to get started on Kabbalah? And it's difficult to, to give a recommendation on it, you know, because it, it's I, I don't know how many books I read on the subject until I feel, feel like I got a grasp on it, you know. So it took quite a few. It's almost like like maybe Gershom Sholem is almost the best way to start. But I did recommend um, uh, uh, Israel Regardi Garden of Pomegranates because that is shorter, but a bit more all encompassing. Right. It, it has all the Hebrew letters and it has all the, the uh, you know, bits and pieces as opposed to the Sephirot themselves, which is the emphasis of fortune. Interesting. Yeah, I will say I studied Kabbalah for a long time, probably, you know, 20 years or something like that. And it, it for, for me now, it's just it's just hardwired. And I, mean, I don't do it actively, but it's just like that way of thinking is so hardwired. Um, but I will say that Kabbalah did not fully click for me. And I spent so much time, you know, learning Hebrew and doing Golden Dawn rituals and doing Gematria, like everyone goes down that rabbit hole and all of that stuff. But I will say that Kabbalah, and I do want to eventually teach a course on this, but Kabbalah did not fully click for me in a real way until I just did, I path worked through the tree. And at that point, it just became a filing cabinet where the entire kind of occult universe and all this disjointed information in my head just just resolved and snapped into place. And I was like, oh, like now everything is well ordered. That was when it really clicked for me. Uh, s- same. It's it's a bit hard wired into the way it's it's almost hard for me if I if I receive a new concept, say in astrology or something, to not want to find a place for it on the tree, right? To not and and I think most magicians of our 
age or generation, it's pretty similar. It's, it's hard to get away from. And I mean, it's hard to get away from anyway. You know, I mean, if you're into Kenneth Grant, you're dealing with the tree. If you're into astrological magic, you're dealing with Kabbalah because like the glyphs and uh, uh, planetary, um, you know, symbols and and even intelligences, names of angels and spirits associated with that planet, those will have their origins in, in Kabbalah. You know? Absolutely. So. Yeah. And one, one of the things, one of the points I made in, in the John D book was it's also hardwired just into our culture uh, in, in a way that, for instance, you, you know, Hindu or, to, or Buddhist symbols just aren't. So a, a really obvious example is, okay, like Valentine's Day, you're buying a Valentine's card for somebody or like you're buying them roses and, you know, the concept of Aphrodite and like all these things are just like hardwired into our culture and, and our cob and, and our, but you wouldn't necessarily think of them as Kabbalah, right? But we're that's, running off that funny. operating system. Yeah. I would have, before you said that, I would have thought that if anything, uh, Eastern mysticism is more hardwired, right? Like it's, it's more common to see like a Ganesha in somebody's house or, um, Shiva or something than it than it is to see a tree of life. Or... Oh, but I don't necessarily mean like actually like seeing people practicing Kabbalah or the tree of life. I just mean that the I'm talking about the association chains, meaning like like at a much deeper level. So for instance, like you would be hard pressed to find somebody in Western culture that does not associate roses with love, for instance. You yeah, see what I'm saying? I mean, I, I, a lot of cultures probably, okay. you know, I mean, there's, there's a reason for those, for those, uh, uh, associations most of the time, you know, there's although a, they also mean death in other places, there, there are some ceremonial offerings in India. Um, so, but yeah, a lot of these are universal because of, you know, the, the world was so much closer together. Uh, and, and, you know, the, even the idea that there's a distinction between Western and Eastern systems, which she talks about in this book, I think that is probably something that would collapse under academic scrutiny in the sense that all these cultures were trading along the Silk Road and, and it was all, uh, people sharing ideas. Yep. Definitely. I mean, you see it in like the Picatrix and the Greek magical papyri, there's going to be all the... You know, in Hebrew, they call you this and the, uh, in India, they call you this and the Romans call you that, you know, they um, Arabic and uh, most magic is is cross pollination of some kind, you know, and that's that's what makes the tree convenient. Right. Because it's able to kind of synthesize in a way. Yes. Yeah. And and pull everything together. Yeah, for sure. And and that for me is like one of the most useful things about it, because as you begin studying this stuff, your brain just becomes a mess. You know, it's like in the in the to quote David Bowie, it's like my brain felt like a warehouse. It had no more no room to hold. And it's just like your brain just becomes loaded up with all of this stuff from Western mythology, Eastern mythology, different words, Sanskrit words, Kabbalah, Hebrew. And at some point, I maybe I don't know if you have this experience too. It's just like I can't like correlate all this stuff. It's like what the and it's like you and it, you get really confused about like, well, what spiritual path should I take and things like that. And then you can use the Kabbalah to resolve all of them into one thing. I mean, you can even resolve Buddhism. You can even resolve, and I want to make this point really clearly, you can resolve essentialism and non-essentialism with Kabbalah because you can associate the Buddhist paths to Ein Sof, right? So, the, or, you know, and the other great thing about it is one of the things that you, you always um, come across when studying spirituality is everyone's saying different things, right? So you have people talking about Western cere ceremonies, you have people talking about astrology, you have people talking about yoga, you have people talking about Christ consciousness, you have people talking about non-dualism and it's like, who's right? And then if you, you can resolve the cabal, it's like, well, they're all right. They're just talking about different spheres or paths. Yes. That's that's how I feel. I'm I'm fascinated by all religious and all magical traditions. There's nothing that I reject ever because the, everything has something to offer and just a new way of saying it, you know. And 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 you never stop running out of associations, you know. Like like sure, uh, yes, I'm uh, and then also uh, Shiva and Shakti, right? If you go from the uh, you, you know the top of the tree, mm -hmm. right, and say that you've got like Hokma and, mm -hmm. and Bina, right, and this con. Constant state of of uh, 
interplay, right? That's that's Uranus and Gaia in Greek mythology, right? Or, right? Ca- or chaos in Babylon. Yeah, exactly. And they're in this constant state of back and forth. And then it's only when Kronos, right? Saturn in, in Greek myth- uh, mythology castrates uh, the father Uranus that 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 material reality becomes possible, right? And this kind of like sh- uh, scattering comes down. And and we see this copulation uh, motif with with Shiva and Shakti, and we find it in, in Tantra and all, you know, Taoist yoga from China is, is, has this and um you know uh binary code has this it's all the same yeah. you know and 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 you can uh categorize and it doesn't have to be dogmatic and it doesn't have to be um uh uh anything like that it's just almost it's it's a it's a foundation upon which you can contemplate any new metaphysical motif that that comes yeah. your way you yeah know? absolutely funny, you mentioned David Bowie earlier, and I always thought about David Bowie too. Just when, you know, for example, The Unfortunate, this book, I'm, I'm familiar with the concepts. I have been for a long time, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't spiral this amazing imaginative uh, function f- for me when I read it, because it does. And it makes me want to look into things so much further. So I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, uh, Hod and, and Netzah, right? Yeah, this, these two, and they're, and they're, and they're above Yesod. So, uh, ish, you could say Yesod maybe penetrates, uh, that realm, right? Where, uh, Yesod, for those who maybe are not familiar, is it, Kabbalistically speaking, it's, it's meant to be the sphere of the moon, right? Which is just above the sphere of the material world, especially when viewed from a Neoplatonic perspective right you have the material reality and then the veil of the moon and then the inter um concealing spheres of the planets beyond that and that figures right into hermetic kabbalah uh, kabbalah so so then so you have what's called like the ruach right the the the, the consciousness and then you have this uh this lunar uh equivalent right the sub the subconsciousness and the neoplatonists would have called this the the spirit right or the, the the animal uh mind and that's not animal to say that it's inferior right because there's nothing inferior about having an animal mind you know and i thought about david bowie when he says his his animal grace right because this is the this is the uh how how the uh, reasoning faculty of Hod or, or Mercury and the instinctual factory of of Netza of, of, of Venus, right, combine to 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 protect the the um, or oversee uh, the, the the lunar functions, right? We have two uh, four. If you can take Malkuth and separate it into four different sections the way you always see it. Why can't you just do that with all of the spheres, right? So you saw you have the one that is connected, say, to the physical world of the physical sure, body. Yeah. And then you have the one above that is connected to the uh, the solar force, right? Or the higher uh, uh, force. And then you have the, the Netzach side that it's going to be more instinctual. And, uh, and this, this communicates more in visual symbols, say, or, or emotional sentiments. And then you also have the Hod side on the other side of, of the lunar force, which is going to communicate more in, in language, right? And in concept and in, um, uh, uh, uh memory and, and whatnot. So, if you do that and every veil of existence in Kabbalah is like a negative corollary to the one that precedes it or a positive corollary, et cetera, then you'll, you'll think like, oh yeah, well, when I dream and the physical apparatus of my body is shut down, the dynamic is reversed. Yeah. During, that's interesting. During, like during waking life, you might say Hod or Mercury is is more dominant, right? You, you have Mercury, uh, like oh yeah, my intellect and my my calculating and and communicating uh, cerebral side is is more active than my um, 
Netzah side that is is more uh, uh, visual or instinctual. But when you're dreaming, it's the complete opposite. Your uh, the the faculty of perceiving visual imprints of visual images and um, uh, emotions that are spontaneous. You'll see a figure that you don't know, but you automatically know this person is 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 warm to you or something like that, or dangerous to you. Uh, it's like we have the 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 reverse uh when we dream and i think that's a really great way to analyze the unfolding for sure of- i i think um yeah if, if you i i refer to in the johnny book it's like i, I say that math kabbalah is like the branch of mathematics concerned with the making of you of meaning and i think but it's really key to point out like you're saying that it is a map in theory of how the man, the how manifestation, how reality manifests downwards or, or manifests into further complexity by going down the tree. But the whole key to magic and mysticism is to go back up and to shut down the functions as you go back up the tree to get to something more, you know, in, internal perhaps or essential or, you know, the, the way of return, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and that's a really yeah. important point to make as well as what you're saying about subspheres. I mean, in, in technically, um, the not to get i want to go too down the technical rabbit hole but but you know it's like every sphere can contains is is expressed on all four levels of the kabbalah and each level has its own tree contained within it so there's at least 400 spheres uh, that you can conceptualize but it's fractal so it's in theory infinite it just it's infinitely recursive and and expanding yeah and it's not even to like obliterate the spheres as you rise i think it's to to harmonize them which is uh, the emphasis, right? So it, it's like, um, for example, we hear today a, a lot of people talking about flow, like, oh, I'm in a flow state, right? Well, that's when like the, the neshama or the, the higher consciousness and the, um, and, and, and the, the ruach and the goof are all sort of like happening together right the physical body the subconscious and the kind of higher consciousness are all aligned and they're all functioning in a way that's harmonious and this is a a a state that we look for right we want to be in flow where things come naturally and, and we can act on our impulses and in a balanced way right where we're not in excess of of overactivity or over inactivity right we're, we're in this centered calm you know and right, which is the it, same it, as the middle way in buddhism so you just find mm-hmm. this way to to tie all religious concepts together so here's here's the the thing that i remember having issues with this with this book though it's like we're talking about basically kabbalah as a meta structure for religious meaning and a way as Cro- Crowley describes it so perfectly, he says it's a filing cabinet. And I think that that's the best way to look at it. And that it seems complicated, particularly if you read this book, but once you get it, it actually is makes things way simpler. So I, I think a more modern way of putting it was would be, well, you just have 10 folders on your desktop and all religious ideas go into one of those 10 folders. And now you only have to think about 10 folders instead of a huge disorganized mess on your computer would be perhaps a better way of looking at it or a more modern way of, of it, it, metaphorically talking about it. Um, but however, as Crowley also points out, it's like the danger with Kabbalah is basically that you you think that it's real and that all of these, you know, all these gods and angels and spirits are, you know, just totally, totally real in this theosophical sense or this like, you know, primitive religious sense rather than, you know, within the broad spectrum of, of shared human consciousness. And that in a, essentially like all these things are, as you point out, throughout world mythology are symbols pointing to underlying meta realities. And you see people making the essentialist mistake all the time. I mean, we can, not to continually harp on them, but I mean, you can point to somebody like Jordan Peterson, who's like going down the Joseph Campbell route, or the, even Carl Jung of saying like, these are archetypes that are just like true and real in some essential and unbreakable sense. 
And I think that that's a total slip. And I think that that's a slip that Dion Fortune makes in this book where you, you read through it. And we can talk about why that is in terms of the context of how, why this book was written. But she's talking about every single one of these things in 777 as if it's like, you know, the great angel Metatron is like watching us all jerk off or something like that. Like they're all ex- 100% real. Uh, and she was a dogmatic Christian also. So uh, so that, that's kind of the tricky bit about this book, I think. And Kabbalah in general is the, the easy slip. Rather to see it as a collection of symbols pointing to things that are real but are perhaps outside of language. Like, for instance, the sphere of hood, of intellectual activity. What is the the essential meaning of that? What Not meaning, but the experience of it. Well, I would suggest that all these symbols that you get in world culture related to the sphere of mercury or intellect or hood are symbols pointing to a deeper reality that you have to experience yourself, whether that's through path working or dream work or just relating incidents in your own life to it. Um, and you know, everyone builds their own map of the tree with their, you can build a tree completely from your own internal symbol system, but your, all those symbols that you see, I think, in Kabbalah are they're products of the discursive linguistic mind or symbol making faculty of the human mind engaging with something deeper. And we could say in Kabbalistic terms, it's like, you know, you have absolute, which is formless and without essentially formless and then or inessentially formless. And then you have you have Bria, which is like an energetic conception of or, a, or an archetypal conception of something. You have you have Yetzira, which is like an energetic conception, and then finally you have like the outward symbols and physical ritual objects and things like that in, in Asaya. So um, that's that's the one that's the one issue I take with Dion Fortune in general is that she's an essentialist and it even extends to like, I don't know if you, I haven't read this book in a long time, but like I, I immediately opened it and started reading it. It's like, this book is racist as hell. Do you notice that? She is such a racist and she's such a homophobe. Yeah. She's also kind of a bitch. Like there's like a lot of like, <laughs> yeah. like really arrogant yeah. like stuff. And then she's like, Oh, like never would I dare go near any of these Clefothic. I'm like, you've got some Clefothic shit that's pretty obvious in your narrative style you know what i mean it's like there's there's definitely some you know imbalanced force in there and like you know snobbery and stuff with her for sure and and uh you know which is which makes the book uncharming right and and uninviting i mean sometimes she's funny but uh, other times it's like dude it's like you're you're going she's putting a little too much of herself into it. You know, I almost feel like regardy is a little bit more chill. And yeah, I, agree. I, I, I think what they were, what they were fighting against at the time is that they really had to like push back against this kind of Victorian model, even though it was Edwardian or whatever, but because people were still thinking that way and people were still grossed out by, by certain concepts or rejecting them so they had to push back very hard and if you read it now you're just like okay take it easy you know and 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 i agree with what you say even i like for example when i when i try to think about um as as an astrologer as i do i try to think about the sun the moon and mercury and venus i'm like oh i wish you could redraw the tree so that the moon is like you know th- so that they all kind of touch like they all kind of intersect and and i'm like mm. well yeah that's cuz i'm getting stuck in the 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 graphic model of the tree and and i'm forgetting that it's not literal you know there's there's not a path there necessarily there's a correlation You know, it's, it's like you, um, that's a trap that I fall into where I'm like, okay, well, you know, now I'm walking this path between these, uh, uh, two Sephiroth and it's like, well, you know, there's not really a path. It's just, it's, it's symbolic and indicative. It's a, it's a useful pattern. Exactly. Of the, of the connection between, um, um, uh, these forces. And as an astrologer, it's like, so important you know because it's it's great i mean you get so much insight so even into somebody's chart like oh, okay the uh the, the sun is is like your salt in someone's chart right and uh, sorry it's uh, uh, tifereth right and then your salt is, is the moon in somebody's chart and makuth is going to be their their ascendant right their, their uh a sensory body right and then and so 
the, the condition and relationship between their Venus and their Mercury and their Mars and their Sun and their Jupiter and their Saturn, all of these things, you know, uh, Kabbalistic symbolism uh, offers a lot of fleshing out of of what can be interpreted in in a natal chart and, and absolutely absolutely or tarot if you're a tarot reader i mean it really is the deeper pattern but yeah no you're totally right i i often say the map is not the territory but it's real useful in exploring the territory and there's a lot of territory you probably couldn't get to without the map you and it's also you know. really ev evocative too right because because i'm like well wait why this and it just starts to get it. for example um uh, take uh, Bina and, and Hokma. They're united by the tarot because I'm obviously a Mathoth deck user, right? I, tarot and astrology are hand in hand to me. And there's a great line actually in the Unfortunes book where she's like, she goes, astrology and tarot and magic are not separate things. They're, they're all, um, you know, a, a cohesive system. And I believe she says that the tree or uh, uh, the Kabbalistic framework as adopted by Hermeticists is a great way to, to see that synthesis. And so as a magician and a tarot reader and an astrologer, it's awesome. So you've got like Hokma and Bina and they're joined by uh, uh, the high priestess card, right? Like, like, which is Venus. And then you have the, 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 we're talking about the three horizontal paths on the tree. There's only three. You have the top one between Isn't, I think the emperor, the empress is Venus. Yes. The empress is Venus and, and it is, and it is the empress. It's, it's Daleth, right? Uh, the, yeah. the, the, the path between, uh, Binan and Hokma. And then, and then you've got the path of Peh, which is the path of Mars or the tower between Hod and, and Netzah. And then you have Leo, right? Which is Heh. Uh, the strength or the lust card in right. the Crowley deck between Geura and Hesed. So we've got Venus, we've got Mars, and we've got lust. And this is the 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 love is the law, and or uh, eros. Uh, Giordano Bruno says eros is the the chain of all chains. It is what links all things. Uh, Eros rules the world, says yeah, Giordano. Le Levy Bruno. says the same thing in the Key of All Mysteries, and he says that the entire tree of life can be, it, you can just superimpose the symbol of Venus on the entire thing. And and Crowley agreed in terms of that being a, a central thing. Love is the law. So, or yeah, but love, but love representing but, union, perhaps, of elements. But Bruno said it first, and and actually, uh, Ficino said it even before that too, because it's like eros affinity is the is is the the agency that allows uh, a union between the human and the divine, or the right. terrestrial and the celestial, or one person to another person. There must be eros, right? There must be affinity. And, um, you know, Yasod is, is, is supposed to be a beautiful naked young man, you know, and, and, uh, Netzach is supposed to be a beautiful naked woman. And then Hod is hermaphrodite, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, so it's, um, you know, this, oh, wait. Tell me about the Levy thing about Venus on the tree. I don't. I don't oh, know. it's in uh, Key of the, the. There's a Levy book called Key of the Mysteries, which Crowley, when he got to uh, whatever the great Adeptus Exemptus or whatever the great is, where you have to write your summation of the universe, Crowley just translated it and he said, "Well, I was Levy in a past life. Here you go." And it's a really short book, and it it, it says he basically just says that love is the key of the mysteries, and that he proves it by you know, saying that you can just draw, you know, you can also connect all the Sephira with the, the symbol of Venus, just as a way of demonstrating that point. How? Uh, uh, just, you draw the circle at the top and then the, the cross is the cross of the elements. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So worth taking a look at. It's, it's an, I remember I read it a long time ago. Uh, interesting book. I want to circle back a little bit though. The, um, to, you mentioned fortune pushing back against the culture and one of the things that one of fortune's many contributions, but one of her most 
at least historically important contributions is the psychological ma model of magic because she was a trained psychologist. She had trained in Freudian. I don't know, but she was interested in Jung later. I don't think she trained in Jungian anal analysis or anything quite that obvious, but she had trained in Freudian analysis and she proposed a model. She basically was, I believe, the first person to say that you can look at magic as a process of psychotherapy. And that was a really, that I think was the point, that was the point that allowed magic to start to disseminate to a wider public. And it was, and, and it still is a model that nobody can really argue with. And it was also the, the de facto model for magic in the 50s. You can see Rigardi obviously picked that up. And ultimately it kind of became a constraining model because then just everything just becomes another internal psychological experience, which really does a great disservice to magic, I think. It's so much more than that. But at the same time, it was so important to... Um, getting it taken seriously by the culture and she's such an important cultural figure but at the same time you know it's like you read this book and it, and it opens up with just all this racial racial essentialism which is a, you know the ultimate danger of essentialist thinking and is why post and is why postmodernism it rejected essentialism following the second world war you know many people you know the frankfurt school and many other people made the point that it's like essentialist thinking by nature leads to, to fascist, incoherent fascist mysticism and, and death camps. So, you know, um, so it's kind of tough to read this stuff now. And she's saying that, you know, there's essential natures to each race that they should not mix their systems and, and all it's of this so stuff. so backward. It's, I know. yeah. And then do you remember that her, she, I, I looked up, she talks about homosexuality as, you know, she ta goes on and on and on about the left-hand path. And then it's obvious she's talking about about homosexuality and that she I wrote I got this from Wikipedia. She claims she condemned the homosexual techniques of malevolent male magicians. And she claimed that the acceptance of homosexuality was the cause of the downfall of the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations. Unbelievable. Yeah, she, she's like she comes across as being she tries to come across at first as being so liberal and bohemian. And then she's like. But these things are abominations and aberrations. I don't think time. she was liberal at all, other than having some of the trappings of what we now recognize as hippie culture. Um, she, on, you know, in Wikipedia, she was basically a high Tory or a conservative, although she was not. Um, you know, here's I had a I wrote down fortune did not involve herself or her group in any explicitly political movement or party. The historian Ronald Hutton noted that in her political and social views, fortune was likely a high Tory with Richardson noting that politically she was somewhat aligned to the ideas of the conservative politician Winston Churchill. And I want to touch on the Battle of Britain later on. But I don't I think she was remarkably conservative and she was essentially a church lady, which is actually a pretty standard setting for a lot of occultists like they're ba she's basically a christian conservative and ultimately a christian zionist which i want to circle back to later so that's and that's something that people don't really think about with the occult maybe post 1960s that there really is you know what you know what you know what what we used to call white lighters or in england they call god botherers you know where they're just real and she was extremely prudish and anti-sex and, you know, had the whole thing about sex should only happen in marriage and there's gender essentialism between men and women and that's really important and all of this stuff. So, so that was going on too. Yeah, maybe modern is a better word for what she was trying to come across as. Yeah, yeah, than, that's a good point. Conservative because she's like, she's, I mean, that's the thing. She It comes across as really harsh and you've got to really like, take it with a grain of salt because I'm like, my God, otherwise you're going to loathe her and you're not going to really get anything, you know, out of the, 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 the book, as far as it being, like I said, either it can do one of two things. It can help to like root and create a foundation of understanding the tree as a hermetic uh, d device, right? I'm not going to claim uh, uh, Hebrew Kabbalists here because my, my experience of it is purely hermetic and my study of astrology is hermetic and pretty much everything's hermetic for me. Uh, so it's like um, uh, you can use it to 
to, you know, strengthen the foundation that the Kabbalistic symbolism offers, or it can also, in my case, in this reading, be used as a springboard for thinking, oh my gosh, like, whoa, inspiring new ways of contemplating yeah. these, these symbols and their interaction and how they work on every level. I mean, I think that the psychology aspect of it is kind of important as yeah. a foundation yeah. because yeah. Yeah. you're it's it helps you like become self-aware and become, you know, psychologically more maybe just balanced and and in stuff like that which i think is good you know for any magician to culti yeah. cultivate yeah. good mental health yeah uh i also think there's a place for burning your fingers and going insane yeah. sometimes <laughs> because if you don't you're not gonna experience anything and you're just gonna read stuff and that's not good either you know but then to be like yeah it's like not everything is gonna fall into some freudian or jungian thing you know and and the what makes archetypes or the idea of them so cool is that they're not necessarily fixed they're like i love campbell you know but the thing but but an archetype is is a mutable thing yes yeah that's a great way to put it and, and that's important to, that's that's the the distinction i think and they that's the key to understanding why these symbols change over time every generation expresses them differently but we're all talking about similar things and there's something about understanding that it really helps you just understand other people and other cultures and, and, and be able to share a common language. And, but taking, you know, taking, I like Joseph Campbell too, but, but, you know, seeing, I guess I would say like Neo Jungians, Jungians, Neo Jungians, like Jordan Peterson, just acting as if archetypes are literal real things that are unbreakable, which to me is silly. And, when we look at fortune, the fact that she was so intolerant in some ways kind of betrays a certain level of realization if we want to be so bold. Because of, in my experience of it, Kabbalah, even if we look at Bina, the sphere of understanding, okay, it's like Kabbalah is ultimately should be an understanding and a correlating of the world as it is, not how you wish to be not how you wish it to be. It's a level of understanding where everything fits in the world and seeing it as a cohesive system that incorporates everything, that everything is part of it. And it ultimately, at least in my experience, kind of resolves into, I would say, even a left-handed perspective in the sense of like an agori perspective of it's all one thing. It's all one taste. There's no, the path of no distinction. Ultimately, there is no distinction between things. They all fit within this tree. They harmonize perfectly, but ultimately they are just expressions of the same thing. It's Kether manifesting into Malkuth and, you know, Malkuth is in Kether as, as, as the crown is in the kingdom. So to reject anything and say it's evil or in, in the words of um, uh, Kenneth Grant, like homose on homosexuality, it breeds devils in chaos. You, you think he would be for that? Um, yeah. If anybody know. was, if anybody was into devils and, and inverted yeah, practices, right? it's, it's Grant, you right. know what I mean? And, and that stuff. And I, I feel um, that that, that rege just to wrap that up, it just, I feel that if, if people are coming from this perspective of intolerance and saying things are not, are perverse or against an order, they haven't progressed that far. I mean, the whole point of Bina, if you read in particular the best Kabbalistic book ever written in my appear in my opinion, the vision and the voice is just a profound text. When, when you read that, it's like the whole point is to strip away. There aren't, there's no distinction between anything. That's the whole point of love. It's like, I am divided for love's sake. Ultimately it's all the same thing. And ultimately it's an expression of emptiness. So to, to kind of be on this white light or God bothering stick up the ass, you know, crusade kind of betrays a, a perhaps a, a certain level of realization that is not certainly not what her what her contemporary or or as she later recognized her superior Crowley was very much engaged with. I'm with you there. It 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 does betray. I mean, it's a great way of putting it. It betrays like not enlightenment if yeah. you're going to be that prejudiced and you're going to be that. Uh, oh well. 
if anything, what's the word righteous, right? She's trying, like, they're trying to be like, oh, like, never would I touch this or never would yeah. I touch that. It's like, you know, never would I dirty my hands with this kind of vibe. And it's like, well, then you're not encompassing all things. You're right. not encompassing pol- uh, polarities or continuums or whatever kind of model you want to look at it in. Right. right? And com- it- compare that to Crowley, whose entire spiritual thrust no pun intended is or perhaps is was embracing everything you know like the formula of babylon of embracing all things or later at at, you know his whole you know he talks about in the 20s absorbing filth into his conception of the universe and embracing and ultimately it becomes just embrace of everything as god and that would no one would bat an eyelid at that in some of the eastern traditions particularly tantric traditions And, and it's just it just makes it is hermeticism. You know, it's like if hermeticism is the study of all things as we, all is one, as above, so below, everything is one substance, as it says in the Emerald Tablet, then that means everything, right? So you have to understand everything. I agree. And I think that's why people are, have a lot of problems with the Neoplatonic model of hierarchy as well, because we're in this phase now where like, we're like, well, wait, I mean, hierarchy is it's very easy to get confused when you start talking about hierarchical models, right? It's that you start thinking about whatever, some aristocratic uh, kind of thing. Right. But then it's, it, it, it all kinds of falls down upon itself. Cause then when you go into uh, whatever the goetic realms, you, you, you have princes and you have deputies. I mean, there's not, there's not a complete chaos in, in the realms of chaos either. Right. So, so it's like, but and cha- chaos I mean, also has its place on the tree. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Or, or it's like, yeah, without Nietzsche, like without chaos, you know, you, uh, one cannot give birth to a dancing star. A very Kabbalistic but, statement. But, yeah. But, but then even Nietzsche almost was too kind of tight for his own ideas. You know what I mean? So they kind of like, like, like yeah. he couldn't break out of this at the end of the day, rationalist kind of uh, uh, what's the word? Non-animist, right? Materialist yeah. uh, worldview and well, that's Hegelian why it's like, dialectic, perhaps. Yeah, but but th- th- there's such a but that's such an interesting point too, and and it, it points to that these things are transpersonal. These things are transcultural. They are across the millennia. You know, once you understand Kabbalah, you can go back and read things written. 4,000 years ago and have a certain sense of it and just the what you're saying of like Nietzsche couldn't couldn't Capacitate it basically is perhaps a way of saying it's like he wasn't capacitating his own ideas He was trying to articulate something Right that he couldn't fully get a handle on and I think just just Expressing that or if we want to talk about that in more new age ways It's like he's channeling an energy that he can only you know, push out so much of, and and that that I think uh, points to kind of the transpersonal nature of of consciousness that Kabbalah is a really good map of. Even Freud was interested in the Kabbalah, you know, and took a oh, lot yeah? of early psychotherapy from it. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's central to Western culture. You'd be hard pressed to find people that didn't weren't at least aware of it, at least in Western philosophy. Yeah. And there is, I mean, there is that danger, like with the Nietzsche thing, for example, like my work with Marsilio Ficino, it's like, whoa, like too much solar energy, like, like for this battery that is my body or my consciousness, right. Or this level. And that's why, you know, the Victorian kind of, or Edwardian, whatever naysaying, what did you call them? God, God botherers. Yeah. Right? That's, a, that's an English bothered. thing. Yeah. They're, they're, they're like, be careful, be careful. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah. You know, like, like some caution, definitely you know but then there's also exploration and there's also like like um you know and i know you'll agree with this that and the tree agrees with this that like the the eastern like center right is eventually something that we want to draw towards right something that something where where harmony and balance uh is is achieved but but to I don't know put sort of barriers on on what is taboo and what is not. I mean, as you pointed out earlier, tantra is is designed around such things. You know, you're supposed to to meditate on a pile of corpses and do do all sorts of things that are are supposed right. to d- disgust you right. uh, in in order to transcend them. And and the surrealists actively sought uh, these kinds of things. And you might 
say, I mean, Rambo really d- derangement of yeah. the senses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that genius can, can pour through, you know, and, and you can look at the, the malefic planets or the pillar of severity as, as aversion and the, the pillar of mercy, uh, benefic planets as attachment. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah, and then the, cent- the central column as, as the, um, the, the, the middle the way. E- yeah, the Eastern right uh, perspective. Yeah, of- just let me riff on that because that's such a great point. Even with Rimbo, I mean, you, you see Nietzsche picking up on that and talking about the Apollonian and Dionysian tendencies in, in society. Well, that's only two spheres, you know, Hood and Nutsock, maybe, or maybe it's Teferoth and, and I think it's, it's two I don't spheres know. of it's two spheres of, of Tifedeth, Yeah. Oh, it's two because, spheres. Of, okay, interesting. Or, well, see, that's the thing. This is like well, where's Dionysus? Now, Dionysus on the tree is Yesod, right? All, all, all we have to do, like, see, the, the fact is, is that there's no right answer to that, and you and I. Can well, that's just, the key. Like, yeah. Yeah, like you and yeah. I can sit or, sit around like like uh you know drinking bourbon and putting it on different spheres all, all night if we want to, right? Because that's that's the the that's yeah, the beauty. Absolutely. Of it, I you know personally because Dionysus is a dead and resurrected god and a solar deity, okay. I would I, I would okay. put him in uh, uh, Tifareth, right? And then you might say that the or or you could postulate that the Dionysian uh, solar essence is more akin towards the Netzach uh, side of 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 Tifareth, right? That comes through Scorpio, that comes through intensity and and sex and death, and that uh, b- between Tifareth and Hod, which is more Apollonian, comes through Capricorn, which is more austerity, right? And and power and and order and and um, and uh, you, you know a c- cardinal earth uh, as, as establishing things, you know, and yeah, the more, totally. Uh, so I, I want to make two points for people that would be really helpful in studying stuff. One, like everything that you're saying, you're basically expressing association chains in your mind that you've made through Kabbalah that are all perfectly linked for you. And you're all you're talking about one thing with everything that you're saying. And so for somebody who hasn't studied Kabbalah, it will seem like twilight language. They won't know what you're saying. But for you and for me, because we both understand it, you're you're expressing like we both know the code. Right. But at your, the point that there's no right answer is really important. So I, I want to make two, two little points. One is everyone, when they get into magic says, why do I need to learn this stuff? Right. And the chaos magicians rejected it totally. And when I, when, when you're in school, every kid always asks, why do I need math? When am I, when am I going to use this in the real world? And I felt the same way. And I was just like, what, what is the point of this? And then I had a political science teacher, my senior year of high school, who said to me, the, the point, the reason they have you do math in school is because it, it actually forms neuronal connections in your brain. It improves the quality of your thinking. And I was like, okay, well, if somebody had told me that in the first place, I would have been so excited about math. They never told me the, the, y- y- that. Um, and Kabbalah is the same. In fact, you probably does just form all these and organize all these neuronal pathways in the brain. The other point that I wanted to make, and it's just so um, 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 fruitful as a practice for its own sake. And the other point that I wanted to make about what you were saying about the middle middle path and the pillars of mercy and severity and Buddhism and Crowley and fortune is if you talk about Buddhism, you look, look at the Buddha, you know, the Buddha was a, 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 a rich prince and he threw himself into total excess and, and you know, he was a party, party boy, right? And then he threw, looking for meaning, and then he threw himself into total asceticism and got nowhere there too. And then he settled on the middle path. And I think we all co- hopefully capitulate that in our lives if we're, if we're sincere um, uh, humans looking for truth. And, but you have to do that through your own experience. You can't skirt around it. The, the whole like Dion Fortune thing or the Christian thing, of cutting off experience and we can talk about Crowley's thing about the black brothers or maybe not, but you know, you can't just like I de- pre identify the middle path and then walk it and never engage with anything else in your life. You have to determine the golden mean for yourself in your own life. And maybe that's what Crowley's talking about a bit with the lemma. It's like, you got to live. You can't just not live. You know, you have to come to that from living it. If you try to avoid it, it's going to happen to you anyway. You know, it's like, it's, 
it's it's denying a side of life that is just there. Do you know what I mean? It's like there is pain, there is Mars, there is Saturn, there's there's excess in in all of of the planets. There is mystery, there's darkness, there are cliffothic path. Or I don't see, I don't even what does that word even mean? You know, right. uh, a path pathways into all sorts of hells and things like that. And, and and personally, in my work as a magician, I I feel you know however far the pendulum swings in one way if i if i feel like i taste holiness and sanctity in some way there's always going to be this pendulum swing of kind of d- depravity or pain or or loss um on the other end and, and if anything it's it's broadening the scope of uh, of my experience so that i'm at the end of the day maybe more a compassionate yeah, person yeah when so, when someone comes to me with yeah, pain absolutely and some and someone comes to me with like hey you know uh i i, I need help from astrology tarot because this is my problem i'm like oh yeah i been that I've, I've, yes. I've been there, Yes, you know, it's like, I, I have suffered in this way yeah. that this other person has. And so it's, um, it's trying to be perfect and, and trying to avoid pain. It's not even going to work if you try. No, I agree. And that for me is is completely my approach. You have to live these things. You have to go. Th- it's not just in a book. It's not a path working. It's not a tarot card. It's the tree of life, meaning these are life experiences um, that perhaps we experience many times in our lives, depending, you know, and and going through it makes you a larger human being and you can't avoid anything. And, and I think nor should you and but you should strive to be perfect but perfect doesn't mean and Crowley is so clear on this perfect doesn't mean cutting things off perfect means embracing everything and trying to be one if you're going to be one with God then that means and God is manifested as everything then that means you you cannot reject anything you have to be one and that for me is hermeticism at its basic hermeticism is just the study of nature as it is by engaging with it and with the assumption that it is all the expression of one essence that is in communicate that created you to understand itself yeah so i mean there's there's going to be initiation whether or not you know dion fortune loves to say well for the uninitiated <laughs> yeah, like yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. like forget about you i'm like you know, there's probably levels of initiation that some, I don't know, guy in her time working in a factory yeah, has, yeah, has, yeah. has transcended yeah. and, and pummeled through that she's never even been aware Absolutely. of, you know, Absolutely. It, it's, Absolutely. it's like, you're going to get, life is going to initiate you. You're going to have a Saturn return. You're going to have a, yeah. a, a, a planetary transit of, of whatever Pluto, Uranus, Mars, Saturn, all this stuff. Things are going to happen to you. You are going to be introduced to evil and to pain and to all kinds of things. And you're going to be shown these things. And your and your, and your own darkness. A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, and, and so it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I, I wouldn't say anybody has to, to study magic or 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 uh kabbalah or the tree everybody there are other paths for other people everybody has their own thing but for me it's been very useful um like i said oh who who knows all of a sudden i'm an astrologer and these things take on a whole new meaning and there's zodiacal uh connotation and their mythological connotation and they're able to recognize patterns in in my own life, in the life of clients and yeah. things like that. And, and on these motifs, they, they do that, uh, you know, a magical order. It doesn't mean that those people are more initiated than other people. Definitely not. It, it, it <laughs> just means that usually the that opposite, but yeah. <laughs> it just means that they're taking a systematic approach to initiation Okay. In order to, to, I guess, contextualize it and, yeah. and come to a certain, uh, understanding and analysis of it. And you might even say symbolic representation mm-hmm. and stuff like that, that can be helpful. Yeah. But initiate, initiation is going to happen to you anyway. Absolutely. But I think with Hermeticism or with any other spiritual system, as long as it's engaged with 
head on. And I, it's very hard to do that within magical orders. And I think for that reason, there anyone who's a sincere student will at some point be pushed out of whatever order that they're in. The people who get stuck inside as admins are the the unlucky ones. Um, but in my opinion, maybe not, maybe not always, but the um, to study magic is basically to go through the experience of life while trying to understand the operating system at the same time. And the, why would you do that? The reason seems to be just observing my life or your life or the life of so many people who go through this is ultimately that you're able to help other people. Uh, understand their process through life, whether that, you know, you're in, you're an astrologer, I'm a teacher, people become writers, people become healers, they take on, um, you know, they become therapists, things like that. And, and that seems to be the, the ultimate outcome. But I do want to, um, this, this is so, so productive. I think with just to make that final point about that, I don't think that Dion Fortune is that great of a model of an initiate or of mental health. And the classic no. example is Psychic Self-Defense, which is our most popular book. It's one of, I believe- Tell me about it. Yeah, yeah. I believe that, that is the most popular book outside of the, in the occult, outside of the Satanic Bible and maybe Donald Craig's Modern Magic. But that book starts off seeming very sane and telling people that psychic attack is normally imagined and things like that. And then she's talking about like werewolves chasing her. And like, she's like, at one point she talks about like, one of her neighbors had like a, a Buddha doorstop that was giving her bad vibes and, and was evil. And it's just like, what? <laughs> it's so paranoid, you know, and, and that uh, like that whole thing, psychic self-defense, it's like, oh, wait, I'm under psychic attack. It's so narcissistic to assume yes. that, that somebody else is psychically attacking you. And, you know, I mean, and, and she thought that throughout her life about all kinds of people to like Kenneth Anger levels of like histrionics. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, thinking like empathy is this kind of superpower that only a few people have. Like, I'm an empath. So and so, <laughs> so and so is a narcissist. I'm like, empath, what does that mean? That you're like a shapeshifter or something? Like, everybody should have empathy right. somewhere installed, just like all of us have narcissism in, installed. In, yeah. Have you noticed that thing on social media where like people like the, the, diagnosis of people where like everyone is a sociopath everyone in your life that you don't like is a narcissist or a sociopath yeah. or like that is like so first of all ridiculous because nobody actually has psychological training who does this but also i noticed that as i was going through this book i and fortune i noticed that tendency where she in in psychic self-defense she talks about how she was you know one of her employees was a you know, a narcissist and therefore a black magician and like caused her all this trauma that she took like years to heal from just by bad vibing her. And it, it seems very similar. And, and now that we're having this conversation, it, it seems so obvious to me in a way that if you are not understanding in the couple, even in the Kabbalistic sense, if you are not understanding that everything is divine, you are part of everything, then by na by nature, you are positing yourself as separate. And if you posit yourself as separate, everything will seem like an attack because it's the rest of existence, like butting up against your illusory boundaries, trying to widen you, you know, everybody trying to break is, down that wall. Ev everybody's on the narcissistic spectrum. You know, everybody has. And what does that even mean? You know, everybody has the ability to feel empathy, you know, and it's, it's become this marketing uh, thing of like, you're obviously an empath. So you're like a special creature that like deserves special treatment okay. and your ex partners, obviously a narcissist. It's like, yes, if you, that, yeah. If, yeah. If, if you think you're an empath and that your ex partner is a narcissist, you're definitely a narcissist because, <laughs> you, because you did something to, for that relationship to fail. You did. We all, we all do, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, to, absolutely. it's, it's actually addressing the same problem we have with fortune to look at things in these polarized ways is just not healthy. You yeah. Know, and you notice that when people get, go down that route on social media, the, the result is always like, and this is part of therapeutic culture as well. It's like, Oh, well just cut those people out of your life. Put up yeah. and like the whole language of like, well, you need strong boundaries, which is true, but it's like, just put up boundaries and just like kick people out of your life. And it's like, well, that you're, you're, you can, I don't know, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's like cut out what doesn't serve you. Like, yeah. what are you? Some horrible child King who needs to be served? <laughs> like, like the Aeon you know, Yes. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, that's and, so good. And, 
And, and if you knew what wasn't <laughs> serving you, you would have gotten rid of it probably anyway, if they mean something that is injuring. Right. And it obviously serves you, know? you because you walked into that experience in the first place. So it is it's serving ser- you. In, in some capacity, yeah. but like li- life isn't about if someone doesn't serve you, cut them out. <laughs> it's, it's like, well, what about people you serve? The customer is always right. Yeah. It's like, it's people, it's like this worldview of like, it's like this Karen worldview of just like giving things one star Yelp reviews and, and, and trying yeah. to destroy them because you, I, I saw just a, a little tangent because pe- this really does seem to be people's mentality. I love Yelp reviews. People are so, they reveal their true psychology on Yelp reviews. I recently saw a Yelp review that somebody did of the Los Angeles Zoo that was like a one star review where she basically said like, I got here early to see the animals and they weren't even awake. They could perform more and be like more entertaining. And she was like, it, like complaining about like the animals not entertaining her. And I was just like, this is human consciousness. It's not like the heights of, you know, hermetic wisdom or something. It's like, this is yeah. humanity. <laughs> like, I, I, I hated Yelp reviews when they first came out. Cause it's like, wait, all of a sudden you're qualified to leave a restaurant review. Yeah. And just like fuck somebody's small business. It's horrible. Yeah. 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 It's really bad. Just cause you were having a bad day, you know, like, and it's just like, and like, it'll be, it'll be a one-star review and it's like, oh, like I got one package of like sauce instead of two or something like that. Anyways, not to go. I, 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 to take it back to Dion Fortune and kind of her mentality, are you aware of the great Cat Lady War of the Golden Dawn? Cat Lady War of the Golden Dawn. No. Neither was, neither was oh. I until I looked at Dion Fortune's Wikipedia page. So the context for this, which is really important, I think, is that um, Dion Fortune is one of the most important writers to come out of the Golden Dawn tradition. And in fact, we can argue that Basically, all of the important occult writers of the early 20th century were members of the Golden Dawn. That's how important that order was. I'm not a big fan of theosophy, but you can say theosophist too. Okay. But interestingly, with with Fortune, she joined the Golden Dawn in 1919. So she was probably like a third or fourth generation Golden Dawn student way after all the stuff had gone down. The main order had already shut down. She was in the Alpha at Omega splinter group which i think was run by moina mathers and everyone was basically just old and burnt out and and she was like the the young bright student who showed up and was and really liked it but she got into a a she became convinced that moina mathers was psychically attacking her just like she became convinced of this with everyone and this is what was on wikipedia fortune's activities including her leadership of the new group and a series of articles that she wrote for the occult review raised concerns for alpha et omega leader moina mathers after fortune suggested that her own organization could serve as a feeder group to mathers alpha et omega mathers expelled her from the order claiming that this was necessitated by fortune having the wrong signs in her aura Fortune later claimed that she subsequently came under psychic attack from Mathers, during which she was confronted and assaulted by both real and etheric cats. Yeah, I mean, it's if you get that to that level of abstraction, you know, where you have power over somebody else and their aura isn't right with your aura, it it just takes away from from what's what what it has to offer you know and and that's what the book did give me was just like honestly like a a a way to interface with this beautiful system of seeing the planetary uh, uh energies and and their interaction and you know even uh like Yes, in a psychological, more self-aware way. I mean, you know, it's like I'm there suffering with whoever is with me. I haven't mastered anything. I have all kinds of pain and all kinds of imbalance in my life all the time. And that's that's part of it, you know, uh, uh, coming coming together. And when you get into these wars that are so yeah. abstract and so astral and so magical it's like well what about like you know the real uh what about your own astral presence you know what about the sheaths of your own uh uh, spiritual or lunar or or kinetic self and and getting those like 
cleaning those up instead of projecting them onto somebody else. Right. And and in that sense, what you're saying, it's like we really do have Dion Fortune to thank for foregrounding the psychological model because you're making that that argument for from the psychological model. Uh, and and so, you know, yeah. not, people also, don't always take their own medicine, you know, but we have to be grateful for for it. Yeah. And also from the interpersonal model, though, you know, because it's like it's like, you know, my the uh the greeks called it spirit right what the and which is more like you might say the lunar essence or yesod essence of who we are and and they called the solar essence soul right and then and then of course we have the physical body and they're interpenetrated and animated by both and the lunar essence the spirit is what governs or you might say receives and transmits information between the cellular body and the physical body and the solar uh, uh, quality, right? The spiritual impulse. And it does that through the agency of, of what are called phantasms, right? And that's why image Venus or Netza and uh, concept Hod mercury right unite in this lunar sphere uh for the communication between the spiritual self and the 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 nervous system right the 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 emotional lunar sphere uh can affect the the physical body directly you know so if we have instinct netza and venus okay and then we have Hold uh, Mercury, which is a uh, uh, logic instinct and logic must must work together in a balanced manner in order for that for that spiritual self to function in a way where that transmission is possible and flow becomes possible. You know, when you're in flow, all of the 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 soul the spirit and the body are all working together in one cohesive unit and and you feel like something else is is working something bigger than you you know this is a state that that we've all experienced and you know this is how we know we're following our bliss as joseph campbell whom i love uh would, would say um is is following your bliss is the same as know your true will i in a way because it's it's like the solar the lunar the physical all the all the spheres of the tree all the aspects of your uh uh, uh psychic and spiritual and physical being are harmoniously uh, working together and what else could be your true will than than to be a conduit for for divinity you know, and and the 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 spiritual self, where you are not um, uh, exerting uh, too much effort, which would be the the uh, severity column, or too much grace, where you become lax, which is the 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 oh, what a cutie, Shiva Inu. Yep, it's my new oh, dog. Be- beautiful. See, my pillar of mercy took over and I had to awe the pup. Well, he's got his mercy and severity, too. He's been slowly destroying my house. I'm sure. Yeah. (laughs) But but, uh, you know, this is this is um, this is, I think, what's what's the equilibrium that that we strive for. If we want to talk in in human terms. Yeah, we should. We should. Yeah, we all should, I think. Yeah. Like not necessarily occult terms, because, you know, magic like. I mean, magic for me sometimes throws me way way off in one direction or another all the time. You know, it's like, but but magic is something I choose to, I guess, experiment with reality in a way um, to, to to figure it out. And um, and it's it's like when we have cohesion and any uh, if someone's talking about mental health or physical health, it's, it's going to be that cohesion and that balance. I think that we're after. Yeah. And I think that's the key to the whole thing, the, the balance or equilibrium and the real gift of Kabbalah is it, 
it basically shows you the stereo settings. I mean, it shows you that you need everything in existence in balance, not just like good and evil or, you know, what whatever dualities or dictomies that people posit. It's like you need 10 things all balanced. There's a lot. But once you have everything balanced and you can get it balanced, particularly with path working and magic, the whole point of magic is is in the Western sense is to balance those things and harmonize those things and clear them out of of just, you know, clephotic, uh, uh, the clephotic residue created by one's own creation. Um, and that's if you want to reject the clephotic material. It, it, there's, oh, there's I don't my... I don't mean reject. I mean, just cl- clean up, you know, like kind of like yeah, uh, yeah. clean, clean up your order, your because when you go through each sphere, this is something that this is one thing that people need to understand about magic is that when you enter a sphere, when you quote unquote take a grade, okay, whatever that actually means, or you you begin your your life begins to center around one sphere, you you not only energize the sphere, you energize the clephotic aspect. So yes. all so all that sh- so it's like you know in in Netsock, you'll see all of your like how you're shitty you know, with other people or relationships or like, you know, or, you know, and it just, everyone has its own clephotic aspect and that has to be worked through. And for that reason, the whole idea of, of, I think of intentionally engaging with the cliffhoth, although I've definitely done it, as I'm sure you remember, um, the whole point of intentionally engaging it and like all these kind of like, like edge lordy you know, black metal books about working the cliff off is just like totally irrelevant because it happens anyway while you're going up the tree, but you just have to do it one by one. Like I can see the benefit, right. Of, uh, I think it was, I think it's, I think it was like maybe La Milo Duquette or somebody like, they were like, somebody asked, well, why on earth would I want to mess with evil spirits? And he's like, well, because evil spirits, if that's what you want to call them, have always been messing with me. No, that's the point I'm so, making. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's just like, you yes, get, you, it'll so, come to you. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, to do that with intention and to do that with love even, or to, to do that with, um, uh, uh, you know, wisdom or curiosity or yeah. compassion you know to everybody's to to each his own uh if you want to be um i mean if you want to be a chaotic and destructive force uh, all the time there's that there, we all must be destructive sometimes you you're playing the role of mars in somebody's life at some point like <laughs> there's there's no such thing as a good person you know it's like yeah, it's that's a, a really that's a say that again that's a really important point I, uh, i'm p- just saying for compassion like, for people just yeah. what you said there's no such thing as a good person there's no such thing as a good person because you're going to be a villain in somebody's narrative at some point, even if you're just playing a tennis match with somebody, you are their opponent. You want to defeat them. You know, you, you are their enemy. You're, you're going to be playing the role of Mars or the roles of, of Saturn or whatever. You're going to be cruel. You're going to be angry. You're all, you're going to do that in your life, you know, it, and, and, um, you're, you're going to bring pain to other people. Um, uh, now people who want to seek that out intentionally, you know, I, I, that I don't really understand. That, that's basically, you're saying the same thing I was saying just with a, a, a different, with a different language. You're, you're express, that's pretty much what I'm saying. You don't, yeah. it, it's the difference between working through it and intentionally holding it up as a path, I think, or a graven image. And, and what am I trying to say? Um, I guess a more modern way of putting this in terms of like approaching the cliff off would be like the process of shadow integration. It's like you have to deal with it. If you reject your shadow, it'll come back and fuck you completely. So you can't cut it off. It's just that you can't make it your God. If maybe I'm still not expressing it perfectly. It's just that like a, a, a better way of saying it is as you if you look at if you look at the process of of magic psychologically is integrating and harmonizing the spheres. You also need to integrate your shadow at each level of those. That's a better way of putting it. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Like that's what I'm saying. The, the Abramelin operation, you have to summon all of the, the Lords of the demonic uh, quote unquote realms, right? Because they're, it's going to light up that, that those corridors as well. And this is what I've experienced too. If I ever have this, this feeling of sanctity or getting close to something that I find divine, I'm, I yeah. always, ex- I always experience the reverse. Yeah. Um, 
uh, around that time. Absolutely. And, uh, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's something I think that, uh, that, you know, what is, what is, uh, a Clefothic, you know, I, I don't really know. I mean, in a sense, aren't we all, uh, Clefothic, right? Isn't Malkuth, yeah. isn't the Shekinah, uh, uh, veiled in, in Clefothic substance? Yeah, we're, uh, we're think- all everything, right? And the Kabbalah is a method of understanding each of those aspects of ourselves. Yeah. Right? But it's, I mean, I, the lunar. The lunar nodes is what like really like confuses me like because you know in astrology we we've got a pretty clear place of of where things belong on the tree that is, is fairly established but then even the zodiacal signs but do you ever see it's pretty common that people will either put the north node of the moon at uh at the top above kete or they'll they'll put the this, and then if they do that, they got to put the south node under Malkuth, or or or, or they will do the opposite. People that like doesn't put make the sense. N- Wouldn't they just be sub aspects of the lunar paths? I mean, they'd be like you uh, know, man- mansions Cop- of the moon. You know, it's like aspects of Yasod. Uh, Austin Kopic made a really good point of of w- that he was thinking that maybe Da Da right would be a good place for uh, the nodes because they are the black sun or or the anti um uh matter and and that's what the nodes do they they eclipse the sun well in vedic you know, astrology they, that would be like rahu like the postulated it is it is, in vedic astrology it is rahu and ketu and, yeah. and rahu is the, is the disembodied head of the demon who is yeah. and he's and he's a hungry ghost because he has no body and therefore he is constantly rahu is is constantly ravenous in a way that does not um like Donald Trump famously has the sun on, on Rahu and, and, uh, Madonna has Jupiter on Rahu. So she, you know, she names herself after, a uh, a a, 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 a spiritual a deity, right? She names herself Madonna. She's always like got the spirit, but no one's really going to Madonna for spiritual advice, right? Because there's Are, something, there's something about the, Are you sure about that, that? <laughs> I don't, I, I think so. Ray there's of some, light, there's good some, album. There's something about the nodes that we don't experience them as natural in this realm. Uh, it, the, the North Node uh, will will manifest things that are too uh, that we perceive as abominable because they're too big, they're too exaggerated. And the South Node is is a gate uh, to to manifestations that are kind of rudimentary or or not completely formed or uh, aborted somehow, right? Because the South Node is is the is the body with no head. It's K2. It it wants to eliminate you know so so you do have this oral anal kind of uh dichotomy with with the north and south node and um you know malkuth is said by some to be the anus of of the of of the tree the right? so, chakra yeah so to put like a k2 um makes sense but then that would that would put rahu at the top of the tree and it's like okay so what are are we you know it is the idea of the the modern astrologer or the evolutionary astrologer that oh we should all go towards k2 uh, sorry rahu but but the vedics have a, a more illustrative and and um i would say accurate and yeah. satisfying uh, uh approach to the the nodes that they are both malefic in the sense that we're they're unnatural. Uh, they, they they travel backwards through the zodiac, which shows that they are uh, uh, anomalous. The, the the planets, the sun and moon, are meant to show us day and night. They're meant to measure time, and it is the job of the nodes to obscure that and to confuse and to um, disrupt. So it, there's something about the nodes that leads to an anomalous and um, and uh, uh, perhaps Clefothic or or something, but it would depend because the, each node seems to be a gate to a different kind of of manifestation, you know. And and so the, the Doth seemed interesting because it's anti sun, right? It's a negative sun or, or the black sun, right? Anti matter or whatever, and 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 that or a is black what hole. The no- yeah, this is what the nodes kind of do. They they obstruct or obscure, um, or invert. You know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I've never been an astrologer, and I don't. I don't know it to that degree. My my cosmolo- my take on 
Kabbalistic cosmology is relating it to the actual physical universe is important though. And I think that in my, the big thing with the Kabbalah that I'm always reminding myself of is it comes from, you know, Kabbalah is a, comes from a time period where we only thought there were seven planets. And it also comes from a time period where we had a, um, a geocentric model of the universe. We thought the earth was at the center of the universe. And so it's basically it comes from this medieval idea that all of these spheres are progressing outside from earth as the center of the onion. And that ultimately you get a, the, pr the prima mobile and, and all this. So at a basic level, I, I tend to follow uh, actually Kenneth Grant who associated the, uh, well, he, he just kept going with planets. And I think that he associates um, uh, Hukma with Neptune and and Kether with Uranus, but I, I don't I don't even know that. I think that I, I'm pretty sure that Kenneth Grant puts uh, Uranus as dot. Okay, sure. okay. And, and, I don't remember exactly. And, it's something like that. But yeah. I will say this: the most advanced textbook of Kabbalah that I've ever come across is Vision in the Voice, which is why I spent like a year just studying that book for the the D book. And the whole point that like the whole point. So I, I just wrote the intro. I just wrote the new intro for um, the new version of Lon Duquette's Magic for Thelema, Magic of Thelema. Oh, oh congratulations. Or, which is now called Magic of Aleister Crowley. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I, I spent a lot of time with that. And I was thinking from my current perspective, it's like, what was the real importance of Aleister Crowley? Because he's such a complex individual, obviously, mm. and he's so important for so many different reasons and so troubling for so many different reasons. And the conclusion from a broad perspective that I came to is the reason Crowley is important is because he took the best practical, he, he merged the best practical techniques of the West and the East, and then he updated them for a heliocentric, not geocentric world conception, which is the whole thing about Resh and Thelema and every man and woman is a star. And so to that, and that's a way bigger deal than it seems because we need to update our spiritual models for a better understanding of the physical universe. We're not the center of the universe. We are right. So even, so even heliocentrism is erroneous then. Right. But that's where we get new eat, right? So it's, it, that's where it's yeah. like one star among many, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And each star has its own orbit. So ultimately a Kabbalah kind of breaks what, you know, it needs to be reconceptualized in a way. And the vision and the voice does a really good job of reconceptualizing that. It's, a, it's an intense, um, mathematically intense book. Yeah. I remember the vision and the voice as, as visions most oh, right all these, like, these uh geometric sort of um uh image making of of these enochian yeah. uh visions that he and, and victor newberg had that's 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 i haven't read it in a long time but that's how i recall i, that I recommend book. checking it out again it's 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 their visions of working through the 38 ers but specifically that it's about the whole thing is initiation into bina and it breaks mm. down all of, and it's not just that it's a, so it's a breaking down of and merging of all previous dualistic concepts of the universe and of all world religions, and then reestablishes the cosmology of the Aeon of Horus, which is now non-dual and it's well, his best book. And, and one thing about Crowley, I mean, you know, I think, you know, the way I feel about Aleister Crowley, if you worship Aleister Crowley, you probably don't know what you're talking about, but if you completely discredit him, you also don't oh, really no. know. He, he's the best about. technical writer on magic he, possibly he, ever. His contributions and his knowledge, like just, if you're a hermeticist, like it's like, if you're interested in hermetic stuff, like, come on. I mean, just as a scholar, his contributions are, are insane. Yeah, yeah. And if you, and you know, you, you probably don't know that if you just think he, because he was a prick and a total awful person. And he has this bombastic and his, his, his style is sometimes just, just awful and all this stuff. But, you know, one of his contributions that, that Dion fortune's book does not um, take into consideration is that she only looks at the, she talks about the tarot quite a lot and, and in, in the book that we're discussing today. And she only discusses it in terms of like, like, Oh, okay. All the, all the fours of the tarot, for example, are all chesed. And it's like, well, Crowley's contribution. Well, one, one of Crowley's contributions in, in the thought deck 
is that the numerical cards of the tarot are illustrative of the zodiacal decan that that card represents. You know, it's like each each sign of the zodiac is divided into three has three divisions and these are the decans and Crowley, every single numerical card other than the aces will have, uh, for example, the four of wands. That is the decan of Aries that is ruled by Venus. You will see Venus and you will see that, uh, and you'll see the glyph for Aries there. So, uh, Crowley's even knowledge of, uh, the decans and the tarot, um, it's a detail, sometimes yeah. hidden detail yeah. of the Thoth deck that people, I don't think recognize. The Thoth deck is so important and, and it all comes out from, you know, the stuff in the vision and the voice and, and his other work and, and Crowley not only modernized magic, but he reconceptualized it for a non-local quantum non-dual non-geocentric ultimately as you point out non-heliocentric universe that probably can last us for a long time and people i don't think people have even begun to get to grips with that um and one one important and that's the book that i always point to and that's why i wrote about it so much the one one important thing if we're talking about crowley to point out with fortune is she was obviously a golden dawn member uh, and but they were friendly and but she met him at i think hastings actually at the end of his life which i was surprised by i thought it would have been earlier than that but kenneth grant wrote that they were they got along very well uh, I recently on the podcast interviewed again Tobias Churton, who you probably know, who's one of the oh best. Oh my god, I love him. Oh, yeah, I gotta yeah, check yeah, out. Yeah. I gotta, yeah, I gotta check out that episode. No, he's super his knowledgeable. Books, his book, The Golden Builders, I love that book, and I love the book that he wrote on Gnosticism as well. Uh, Tobias Churton is awesome. Yeah, he's great. He's 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 a gem, and um, he's now written, I think when he's done he's almost done but his his quote-unquote biography of crowley will be seven volumes so he mm -hmm. probably knows more about crowley than anyone else i can think of including you know Pergarabo kaczynski is a great book but tobias Churton's goes into even more detail like he he goes into detail detail like what crowley ate every day it's like oh he knows God. a lot about Crowley, but he do I want to know that? I don't know if I want to know. Sometimes that. it's interesting, you know. He actually had some good recipes. I know it's like to a point where it's like, yeah, but yeah. but it's good that it's it's you know it's important that this stuff is recorded and and assembled because Crowley's work is so confusing because he was so many people, which is in my way of thinking his way of like we were just talking about trying to embrace as much of exp human experience as possible to understand it and the. Uh, and then being able to talk to people at so many levels, like we were, you know, it's like, like Crowley, we were just saying in the office, like uh, Crowley is like David Bowie, like no matter who you are, there's some phase that is going to appeal to you because he was so many different people. But yeah, well, you know, Crowley and the Golden Dawn are very unfashionable at the moment. You know, everybody's like, you know, very into like. Uh, and I'm into this stuff too, like the PGM and Picatrix and, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. and a, lo a lot of like cunning man stuff and, and, uh, I'm aware of uh, that. uh, gr grimoire stuff. And, and, and the fact is that people don't, uh, realize is, is that a lot of this stuff was actually preserved. Like, for example, they had a grippa you know, the golden dawn and, and they must have known Picatrix, even if they, it wasn't part of the curriculum, like all For these, sure, planet, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're into astrological magic, which a lot of these people are, then it, it's you, uh, Kabbalistic schemes and, and number grids, all that stuff. That is a Kabbalistic yeah. practice. That's a golden dawn practice. Um, it's, it's in there, you know, and I think that they don't like, um, there's a lot of things they don't like, right? The grade systems yeah. and the racism and all that shit. There's a bunch of terrible stuff about it, but you know, yeah. If but where is there not terrible stuff? Candyland. You know what I mean? It's like oh, it's yeah, like, like what are we just yeah. going to reject everything because there was you know throw the baby out with the bathwater? It's like the point yeah. is to build to learn and to learn. You know, it's like when we talk about magical tradition, miss inherit me. You know. People passing on their mistakes is as much as a part of the tradition so that you can learn from them. In fact, that's probably more important than the stuff they got right so that you don't repeat it. That's like what parents try to pass on to their children, hopefully, to not make their mistakes. So to reject the whole thing, um, I, I disagree with. So, so, but, to, and then I'll, I'll, let me address that 
I'll come back to that real quick. But the, the last point that I wanted to make about Fortune and Tobias Churton is Tobias Churton said that, that, that privately Fortune recognized Crowley as her superior 100% within, within quote unquote, the order. And was I think I think she 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 uh, admits to that yeah. in, in even in the all of her work that, is based on Crowley's stuff if you look closely yeah yeah, yeah. and and I'm, I mean Levy you know uh, Eliphas Levy it, like you you reading that intro chapter to that book on your podcast I was like oh my god that was fun I, it would be weeks but I would love to do like like. D- dissecting that there's so much beautifully veiled decadent language in lfs lavi's there's book. a lot of stuff and we had to leave out too because there's some racist anti- anti-semitic stuff in there too that we just there's didn't oh record. yeah there's, yeah there's there's fucked up shit but but it's like there's like it, it's almost like he weaves a cabalistic language of his own where he's like okay what does he mean when he talks about the old queen of the world yeah it's you know beautiful and, writing and, it's like and, kind of clear, and you know? um yeah does is he speaking of, of of venus as the morning star is he speaking of a lilith uh, lilith is the point where the moon uh and everybody has lilith in their chart lilith is now in in the middle of cancer right about 14 degrees cancer uh, lilith is where the moon is at is at the uh her slowest in her orbit, you know, and you might put Lilith at the bottom of the tree of life, right? She is the rejected, uh, she's, she's the rebel, uh, at the beginning of creation who refuses, uh, to be the consort of Adam. And they say that she is the mother of, of abortions and, and, uh, uh, masturbation and all this. So, you know, she, Lilith is a figure that I could see, uh, being situated at the, uh, bottom of the tree. And well, then Crowley, Lilith- Crowley associates Lilith with the highest levels in vision in the voice and has this whole vision of her appearing and masturbating with a crucifix. And just being the mother of all corrosion. And it's interesting because it's basically the same as what was later in The Exorcist. Well, I want to make it clear that I don't reject Lilith by by putting her at the bottom of the tree. I mean, I think she's uh, an important and liberating um, uh, uh, figure, right? As like, and this goes back to what we're saying, just because a figure is destructive or demonized does not mean that there isn't a, a liberating and redeeming quality to something like Lilith or to something like, like, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a goetic demon or, or a, a clefotic uh, sphere, uh, something like this, you know, um, sometimes uh, those kinds of inversions, such as what Lilith represents, are, uh, they are sacred, right? I mean, it's like, it's like Hecate, right? The, the aspect, the, the lunar aspect that, that it dwells in crossroads, and, and, and she is the patroness of magic as right. well. You know, so so yeah, the, and she's asso- but she, and she's associated with um um uh, path of Gimel, you know, like straight together. Yeah. So yeah, like even the even the masons, the stone that the builders rejected, absolutely, has now, yeah, the now become off. the yeah. cornerstone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so material that is rejected and material that is looked at in a superior way. I mean, honestly, if you're like so into the grimorium verum that you hate the golden dawn you're in a way being it's, like bigoted well here's you know, my big- here's my point on that and and i i'm this is going to offend a lot of people and i don't i don't really care um that the whole grimoire th- i'm definitely aware of that the whole grimoire thing um and like grimoire purism and all of that um is just an absolute non-starter for me and I mean, they're interesting. They're cool. You probably can get results from them. But here's why. Let me argue why in a few uh, in a few different ways. One is um, older does not mean better. And in fact, a lot of these things were written by people with, you know, l- less education and less. And just because somebody wrote it down way back when, I mean, it's like in our modern day, they might have just been like some mo- like. 19 year old kid who's into slayer but they they automatically have this air of authenticity about them just because they're older when i was in Kathmandu, it's like they have their own grimoire tradition and i would go into bookstores where you have all of the most intense high 
incredible books on Vajrayana and, and, and Eastern mysticism and stuff you'd never find in the U S and it's just like overwhelming the level of like spiritual wisdom on display. And then they have kind of like their own grimoires tucked away and it just looks like the scribbling of illiterate people compared to it. And I kind of feel that way about the grimoires here, but well, what I think about, wait, hold on. I want to make my other points and then I will, I will completely turn it over to you afterwards. So that's the first reason. The next is, if you look at it academically, during the D sessions, which I, you know, I hold up, you know, obviously I wrote a whole book about it, so I, I, I'm very, very interested in them. When D and Kelly get the angels to finally appear, one of the first things they tell them is the grimoires are all wrong. And basically what they say is these are the scribblings of monkeys trying to ape the language of humans. And it's like people trying to make a, like a, um, a bad drawing of the way the angelic way the reality really works. And then the angels are like, let's give you the real thing. And then they transmit a Nokia and every single thing is more elegant. So for instance, they give them the Sigillum day instead of the, um, whatever that, the, the earlier book, what was the, there was like the Armadale or something like that. Uh, they correct all the grimoires and then they say Enochian is the actual system. And then finally the, um, in terms of rejecting Crowley, I don't think that anyone has even begun to understand his level of contribution. And I don't mean that in like an OTO sense or a like emulating Crowley sense. In fact, the, like as I put in that introduction to the book, it's like if you're emulating Crowley, you're missing his entire point. The fact that he made himself such a ridiculous individual did two things. One, it made sure that we remember him. Secondly, hopefully, it shows us what not to do and makes him such a bizarre character that we have to do our, it's about doing our will, not his. But if you want gear that works, even yoga, like Crowley's yoga instructions are better than most of the stuff that you can get from yoga instruction now, in my opinion, or on Theravada Buddhism. So for me, that whole argument is just an absolute non-starter. And the, then the final point I wanted to make is like, did you all, it's like chaos magic never happened. It's like, did you miss everything that we did in the 90s and the 2000s? The whole point of magic is you don't need to ape some grimoire. Make it up yourself. Magic is a living process that comes out of your engagement with, with the world. That's interesting to me. That's what I, the spirit I teach from, not trying to go back and turn it into a paper chase and find like the ultimate book of magic because you're not going to find it. Yeah, but I think what makes the PGM, for example, uh, like charming is that level of not education right that level of okay. uh, uh i mean obviously not illiteracy because it was written down but it's it's like these are this is magic that is like like from uh uh you know non-patrician sectors right so so just because something is is maybe less educated or less literate i don't think makes it shittier magic and and you're the expert but the angels said a lot of bogus shit to John D and Edward Kelly. Like they'd be like, okay, so here's this lawman. And okay. They'd so come that, back later. But no, that's actually a really important point. Cause if you look at that on, and I thought about that a lot um, throughout the spirit sessions, they always give them a false one first for every yeah. single bit of the furniture. They give them a false one first and then they come back and correct it. But before they give them the false ones, like the whole first part of the whole first few books of mystery are them basically trying to like get the goetic influence off of Kelly and kind of clear out tendencies. So I read the spirit sessions as a a record of a continual refinement. And the refinement was not of the angels. The refinement was of Dee and Kelly to be able to capacitate and understand what they were receiving. So I see that actually as not contradictory at all. I see it as a spectrum of, okay, it's like basically what the angels are saying. It's like, okay, you have crude renditions of these things already in many cases in the grimoires. Those are wrong. Let's give you new ones. Okay. Those are mostly wrong because you weren't ready. We need now we need to like basically like upgrade the software. Here's the one that's actually real. But if you look that it was consistent, there's always two for every single one. And so the final like the, 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 the final version is at least the best that we have. And so I actually don't see that as contradictory. I just see it as a process of, of refinement. 
Yeah, and you know much more than I do about the Enochian, obviously. But the but like I'm a magic whore. Like my legs are open to <laughs> all, and I'm tainted by none. I have there's oh, totally. no. I I do not reject the grimoire tradition. I do not reject Enochian magic. I do not reject the Golden Dawn. I do not reject the PGM. I do not reject um. Picatrix. I no, I'm all for uh, that. But I'm, like, I'm agreeing like, with you when you're saying that, like, to reject more recent developments is pretty silly. If, if you embrace all of it, as you, you know, magic is fun, you know, it's like embrace all of it. But to reject the new in favor of the old, as you were saying, is a non starter for me. Yeah. And, and to, and to embrace the rejected. Do you know what I mean? To, mm -hmm. to embrace, like, like, I, I have never read a book on magic that I did not like. Okay. It's like, there's always something about it that turns me on, that excites me. Even if I don't end up mastering a certain system or whatever, it's always beautiful and it's always interesting. And, you know, what if, what if the Enochian angels, uh, you know, had, uh, all sorts of like, I mean, they, like the Enochian angels, it's interesting. They, it's like, they, they want people to do a lot of the things that like, uh, uh, like aliens ask people to do, like sleep together with each other's wives and, and stuff like this. Wait, this, what uh, aliens are you talking to? I need to, uh, I need to oh, bring different uh, ones well, to my parties. Yeah. Th there's a great, um, like for example, uh, you know, extraterrestrial contact, a, a human kind of inter, uh, uh, you know, I know that, that J Jack Parsons, they were told to right, sleep right, with right, each other's right, 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 wives and right, stuff. Yeah. And, then, and then my, um, she's kind of my friend, uh, 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 Christina Engelhart, she was a muse of Fellini and Fellini, she, Fel these aliens were communicating with them and they were wow. asking them to like sleep with each other in like very D and Kelly kind of ways and, and, and all this stuff, you know, and like, like just because the, sp the spirits of the Enochian system might have a different agenda than the spirits of some grimoire, uh, whatever, say the grimoire in Verum or the le le whatever, let's keep, who cares? that doesn't doesn't mean that one thing is wrong no you know? i think that the, the point the angels were making is not the it, the, the point the angels were making is not that the, the gamors are are wrong it's just like the way they look at it is like a kid trying to draw the, it, basically they said that okay you're going in the right direction but it's like a kid trying to draw a model of reality with crayons like that's pretty much their their opinion it's like why don't we just give you the actual thing instead of you trying to figure it out because you're not evolved enough to be able to do it that's pretty but much that what that sounds saying. like Dion fortune thinking she's so evolved over a, another culture you know but but it's, importantly importantly to point out this is the angel saying it and Dean kelly never understood what the hell they were saying i mean like Dean kelly were like asking them to loan them money and things like this i it know they're, they're beings that called themselves angels we don't we don't know what well, the, uh, what, well what is an angel and what is an alien and what is i mean i i I take the spirit diaries pretty much at face value, I have to say, but I will say to your point that I talked to Whitley Stryber, um, you know him, who wrote Communion. Oh, right. You know, remember that famous book from the 80s and the movie? Yes, yes. For a while? Yeah, so I, I was on, when I was promoting that book, I was on Whitley Stryber's podcast and he, he, I was reading some of his books about aliens. And you may, re, you may remember this, this was really interesting and, and in the D sessions and also in the Parsons Set the the Babylon working sessions. They're con you may may or may not remember this. They're constantly reporting hearing weird knocking noises, mm. and R Whitley Stryber also talks about it. But it's like a it's almost like a Masonic pattern. It's like a specific knock, and Whitley Stryber describes the exact same knock happening before he was abducted each time in communion. And so I asked him about that, and he he thought that was he had never heard of that before. He had never studied any Western magic or anything like that. And I thought that was really interesting. The other thing, he wrote a book called Supernatural with Jeffrey, Jeffrey Kripal. And it's really interesting. If you go back and look at, now we have this kind of like pop culture idea of like gray aliens and anal probing and all of this stuff. But if you go back and you read what Stryber actually wrote, it sounds much, much more like levy or like traditional western magic stuff where he's talking about like he, he's constantly just describing like blue trolls showing up and like all these bizarre creatures that sound like elementals and at one point in the spirit diaries kelly discusses seeing like a, a blue troll show up and it just breaks his arm 
for no apparent reason. And, and like Stryber describes something very similar and like the texts are like very close. Uh, and there's a lot of really interesting things in there. No, the other th interesting thing is when Babylon shows up in the spirit records and gives gives her classic daughter of fortitude speech it sounds exactly like thunder perfect mind which wasn't dug up until 1947 in the dead uh -huh. sea scrolls and p.s it was dug up exactly a month before the babylon working started or after something like that so yeah there's enough stuff no. like that where it's just kind of like okay yeah like they're, those, they're, nag something's hamadi, real here. those nag hamadi scriptures are so amazing and you know one of one of the beef that i have with alistair crowley is it's like okay if you didn't write this and some angel did how come it sounds exactly like everything else you ever wrote you know what i mean it's like that style i'm like i hope that the angels have better poetic voice than Crowley had. It's so obnoxious. Oh, well, although you could argue, well, it still came through his nervous system. Like he I wrote know. it down. Yes, you I, know. I've been I've been given that argument before. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, the, Well I'm but, I'm not arguing on Book of the Law I'm I, I won't make an argument either way. I will say that Vision in the Voice is like so far above the quality of the, the writing is so profound and it's like for you know for like the most obvious look the most obvious the most obvious explanation for both of the book of the law and vision in the voice is they were doing mescaline right because crowley was like the the england's expert on mescaline he had access to it he was dealing mescaline you know he was dosing people on mescaline at the time so probably he was just doing a lot of magic and mescaline and then writing down what he was seeing but as we all know like yeah, you can mix psychedelics and magic and get some profound results. And I'm not recommending it. I'm, you know, but someone I met told me it can be done. And um, the quality, and so, you know, I would argue it's like the quality of the writing. I mean, I think that some of these things are like some of the, the, the hallmarks of world spiritual literature. It's like the quality of the writing, regardless of how they came into being or the, or Crowley, even if Crowley himself wrote them, they're they're profound, you know. But the thing I mean, about the spirit diaries is, is it seems to be something else entirely, and and that's I, quite interesting. I'm with you that that angels and aliens, the way we distinguish those things right now, we don't really know. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. there's that's, so that's our I, nervous system I, filtering something. I, I, yeah, I recognize the parallels between angelic or occult uh, 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 things and and extraterrestrial things. There's there's so many, so much crossover there. And you know, there's this guy, a prophet Yahweh, and he claims to have read the Old Testament in Hebrew, like some Shem HaMeforash shit. And he goes and uh, as sorry, not shit, not shit. Those are very pious <laughs> angels. I I don't want to upset them. Uh, but the, the but, must but, be honored um, as well. But, you know, he can summon UFOs, essentially, he claims after having this. So, and, and you can see it. There's videos of it. It's crazy. And so I'm like, okay, a UFO. Is it an angel? Is it an alien? Is it a, we, we don't know, you know, and, and that book, High Weirdness is so great because it's like, okay, it, like, exactly, yeah. just like you said, our perception of this stuff, there's so much crossover. So just because the Enochian angels don't like the Grim Wars, that doesn't mean that nobody should read the Grim Wars, you know, it's like, like it's it's like they're they're different they might be warring tribes or something the enochians might hate the the uh you know lucifer and and uh well, that's and not what they're, that, that, i agree but that's not that's not what they're saying they're saying that they're just giving them the accurate versions rather than the the traced ones they're just saying they're, let's say here's the actual one right let's up, let's update it for you I say if the system works and people are getting benefits out of it, then then no, I let agree with you. But, but I agree, with, I agree with you. I just think to reject, I'm I'm also agreeing with you that to reject every you know to to reject Crowley and the Golden Dawn is just is just disingenuous. It's yeah. like there, it's it's kind of like re, it would be like rejecting all of psychology and psychotherapy because Freud was a cocaine addict and had a lot of dumb ideas about women, which he did, you know, it's like yeah, Freud did I, not get everything right, but like, where would we be with this wouldn't exist without him? You know, it's like we build on that scaffolding. So, yeah. I, and a lot of times I think people do it just to sound smart. They're like, Oh God, I hate Agrippa or, Oh God, I hate like neoplatonism or whatever. Okay, and it's like, like okay, <laughs> fine. But you know, recognize that, you know, I, I try to be as, as 
um, uh, respectful of all traditions as possible, even if it's one that I don't resonate with, because I, I think that there are many doors that, that can lead people, uh, to, to what they're going for. Yeah. And you pe know? people may, and it's like different things may resonate with people and be appropriate for them at different points of their life also. That, and that yeah, doesn't that mean too. that what they were into before was not what they needed at the time. That so, too. but that's similar yeah. to the you know, it's like an ongoing refinement process. So, but yeah, I mean, to to reject the Golden Dawn and Crowley for political reasons is is just missing the point, in my opinion. Crowley's been dead for seventy five years now. You know, it's like there's a lot there that we can build on. And to be frank, have you seen anyone that has surpassed Crowley in terms of the quality of their work? I mean, do better, right? Like, I will be first in line. So, yeah, if you're talking about magic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and writing and scholarship and clarity of thought. Yeah, it's the nonfiction writing that I have a problem with with Crowley. Okay. <laughs> it, no, no, sorry. I like the nonfiction stuff. It's I like his scholarship. Yeah. Except for when he's being a total prick. I just don't like his poetic style and all the like, you know, lapis lazuli. Right, right, soft, right, 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 right. Soft, soft core porn and and I bad like the soft core porn. Uh, rhyming scheme. I mean, <laughs> Dion Fortune does it too. You know, the same so stuff. <laughs> So but like, but yeah, yeah, no, totally. The, yeah. Crowley is, um, he is his own ordeal of the demon Crowley to pass through, to bring it back to, to fortune. When I was looking, uh, when I was doing a little bit of research, you touched on this earlier where she says that like, you know, particularly in this book, she says, you know, you are not ready for the practical secrets of the Kabbalah. We can't tell you how to actually do it unless you figure it out on your own. And she's like super high and mighty about that, which is so in contravention to like, you know, post chaos magic, which is just like, here you go, you know. Um, but so one thing that at least I have never seen is any record of the magic she was actually doing. I mean, I was never a member of the orders that came from her, Dolores Ashcroft, Nowicki's orders, although there's a lot of people in them. Um, so this, but I saw this, this is from, um, and interesting, interesting, interestingly enough, this was going down right next to somewhere I lived for a year in London in walking distance. This was, I saw this on Wikipedia. The fraternity's rituals at their Bayswater temple were carried out under a dim light with fortune claiming that bright light disperses etheric forces. An altar was placed in the center of a room with the colors of the altar cloth and the symbols on the altar varying according to the ceremony being performed. A light was placed on the altar while incense, usually frankincense, was burned. The senior officers sat in a row along the eastern end of the room while officers who were, were believed to be channels for cosmic forces were positioned at various positions on the floor. The lodge was opened by walking around the room in a circle chanting with the intent of building a psychic force up as a wall. Next, the cosmic entities would be invoked with the members believing that those these entities would manifest in astral form and interact with the chosen officers. That's actually really interesting to me. It sounds like they're kind of doing a Masonic thing, but the officers represent, you know, co you know, cosmic forces as it's, it's putting out. Uh, I mean, it, it sounds like garden variety, golden dawn stuff to me. That's it also like, sounds like that. That's true. That's true. But the, the thing about fortune is, well, okay. Do the what do the office the, the officers in the Golden Dawn represent Sephiroth? So I guess technically that could be the same thing. Yeah. Right. There, the each Sephiroth has an intelligence and a spirit and a deity and all that other. Okay, know. so maybe she was just doing basic Golden Dawn ritual, but that's the first time I've actually heard of any any record of her ritual work. Um, and the interesting thing about Fortune, if we just want to talk about her technically, is. Um, the mystical Kabbalah, she basically took the technology of the Golden Dawn, but she layered in a ton of theosophy and Alice Bailey and all this stuff. So the stuff in mystical Kabbalah is basically her taking Crowley's correspondences and then doing like new age style, tra like trance channeling to get her visions of them. And she's doing that in a very theosophical context, which is like there's ascended masters, the master Jesus, the master Rikosi are like, you know, literally real and sending us messages from beyond the Himalayas and things like this. So um, th there's a lot of context there. Liter again, essentialism and literalism, but I think that's worth pointing out as to where she was getting this stuff. It was, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the it's mostly theoretical. She 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 cites Crowley 
by name all the time and uh and uh also blavatsky and you know blavatsky was heavily uh, uh influenced by levy and she she outward she mentions uh, uh blavatsky mentions Eliphas levy all the time you know and as well as the east the the eastern traditions that she was you know appropriating for for theosophical purposes but um you know it's like like uh, even though I've never been a theosophist, I and I I I find Blavatsky problematic at times. I I recognize her contribution, sure, sure, you know. Yeah. I, and if anything, I feel like Levy is is uh, uh, the unsung hero. <laughs> you know, nobody really like uh, 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 there's things that he brought into like the onto the bookshelves that I don't know before that where they were where yeah where they oh, where yeah. they really were he was the first person to put the tarot on the tree of life that's massive yeah yeah that's you massive. know and and it's like because you had the, the like after the renaissance died out right and you know ficino and and uh um, um pico della mirandola and uh um agrippa right and, and then you have the reformation and nobody was interested in that shit anymore. Yeah. And then, and then Levy comes yeah. up in the in the cultural milieu of of decadent uh, fond de siècle Paris, right, where we have a uh, Lautremont and where we have yeah. um, uh, 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 and and these guys, you know, like uh, against nature and, and Labat and all these books, and and that what that atmosphere um, made yeah. Levy. He was able to to uh, bring magic in through that kind of French diabolism kind of. Atmosphere. Yeah, he was such a. That's really. Yeah, the, he's such a pivotal figure. And the other thing to to he was also like a proper, like defrocked pervy a defrocked mm-hmm. Catholic priest who's like somebody from a Milo Minora uh, comic or something like that. It's like it's like very interesting character. Um, yeah, interestingly, when I was in when I was in Paris. A, a long time ago and I was going to all the occult shops it they they pretty much like froze their occult stuff at the end of the 19th century I, I have a French friend I talked I talked to about this stuff and she's like oh yeah like we were over that like before England even got into it it was like we were over that at the end of the 19th century we moved on and like the so the stuff they have in like occult bookshops is like Levy and Pappas and they pretty much yeah. like like cut but, it off there oh please uh, we cannot do that it's, yeah yeah so <laughs> Uh, but, uh, the, the, um, but I, I don't know. I think that, and I love that. I mean, that's so that whole French decadent movement. Yeah, I mean, it's look cool. It, like, it's like, like, look, like, like those are, I mean, forget it. Maldoror by Lautremont. That's, right. that's one of my favorite books ever. For and, sure. and talk about rejected knowledge. I mean, that's the most taboo, fucked up, crazy uh, a book. And then that stimulated surrealism uh and then surrealism was was so occult right and i I talk about like derangement of the senses and and uh, you might even say tantric inspired um um uh uh voluntary um uh altered states of consciousness you know and embracing the disgusting and the, the the taboo so so you know these are currents that ran through uh culture at at the same time even if they weren't magical per se they were very influenced by alchemy you know and uh, oh yeah 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 for sure yeah yeah sometimes you just get the best of, like like one of the things that i i often tell people it's like if you want to get occult information the last place to look is occult books it's like it's all occult meaning it's hidden but it's hidden in plain sight it could be in artistic stuff it could be in pop culture it could be in surrealism has so much like you're talking about yes and, and surrealism that point is, as well. is massive and and the theosophy also kind of deserves that credit for being such a a, a cultural force oh, yeah I they mean, were a people, big deal they tried to take over like, part of india i mean and we probably wouldn't like, have had gandhi without them so yeah theosophy was like um well people were starved to death 
for anything occult because the Reformation was like, and, you know, the Industrial Revolution made everything so disposable and materialistic and bland that, that theosophy shows up and everybody's like, we'll take it, you know? Yeah. And, and, and. Oh yeah, none of this they, ever would have happened without it. And yeah, and, and so it, it really, um, it, but theosophy was so influential, you know, like, like with Kandinsky and, 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 uh, you know, Hilma of Clint, which like all these painters, it, it, it had a very seamless dialogue, you might say, with the arts. And that, that was what was cool about it too, you know, and, and yeah, Blavatsky was sometimes a charlatan, definitely a racist definitely yeah that, i mean we get the whole like root racist thing that fortune is talking about and then later the nazis talked about you know that comes yeah. from blavatsky but yeah. um but that said i mean yeah and and dion fortune was super into blavatsky and and was part, was one of the founders of the back to blavatsky movement when theosophy started splintering so i i want to uh, touch on I, I mentioned at the beginning of this like talking about kind of the broad political context of this and um one of the things about Hermetic Kabbalah and Christian Kabbalah is they are obviously not the Hebrew Kabbalah. And there's a real history there in the sense that where does Kabbalah come into the Western? Oh, I mean, even to say Western is apart from, from Jewish culture is just a non-starter because they're the same thing. But um, the where it comes into, just to be more specific, the Christian and Hermetic dialogue. Eco. Pico. Yeah, Pico, right? Well, it starts with with, with the, in the 12th century with I think Isaac Luria, but it's it is Pico and 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 them who started to merge it with um, the Hermetic stuff, and then Isaac, particularly Isaac Luria though was a Jew, and and yeah, yeah, so no, I, yeah, you know, yeah. All, all of the the, the Spanish uh, rabbis and whatnot. I mean, all Kabbalistic literature is, is, is medieval, right? Renaissance, right? right? It's not right, like, right. like none of, like none of it is, is older than that. And then Pico della Mirandola is the one who brought it into a Renaissance Italy. And he was for a short time, but, but still very, very heavily influenced by Marsilio Ficino uh, was his, was his direct teacher. I don't know what went on between those two, but they definitely had some kind of disagreement. Uh, Ficino was much older. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pico was, you know, kind of this boy genius or whatever. And he was actually, you know, noble born Pico della Mirandola, whereas uh, Ficino's they were Ficino and his father were like court physicians, like to the Medici and stuff like this. And right. then Pico reject, rejected Ficino's ideas of astral magic saying that without the Kabbalistic uh, incorporation of essentially angels, right. Or, or uh, divine names and intelligences and, and the kinds of, of things that, that Kabbalist, but you know, Ficino didn't write about, that stuff because you would get burned at the stake right, you know what i right. mean it's like it's it's so it's surprising that pico well pico then apologized for it later and said sorry i don't know what i was talking about i'm yeah a, agrippa I'm did a, that too he had i'm um i'm a devout christian yeah yeah, you know? yeah, so, yeah. So, so um but but yeah that's as far as we get um you know if, if you want to s separate Hebrew Kabbalah from Hermetic Kabbalah. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, is, is that problematic in the first place? And, and I, so I'm interested in pointing to the, the, the Jewish side of that in the sense that, and, and I, th from the best that I remember, a lot of the Kabbalah comes from when, and the influence of Kabbalah on European culture is, comes from when the Jews came to Spain in the 12th century. And it was from that, that later the Hermeticists picked up on it, but what you never hear about when discussing the when discussing Kabbalah from this the Hermetic Christian Christian Kabbalah you know the Christian Kabbalah was their creation Pico and 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 so forth, but um, you know the history of Kabbalah politically in Judaism. I mean, there was a lot going on in the second millennium. There was Lurianic Kabbalah. There was um, Sabbateanism, uh, or, uh, the, the Sabbatai Zevi uh, messianic claimant, there was Frankism, there was, and, and then, and then in our world, more, more visibly the Haredi 
you know, what is referred to as Orthodox Judaism, but that's a name given by reform, reform Jews are essentially are all that's Kabbalistic Judaism. So there's a lot going on with Kabbalah on the Jewish side. And obviously because it comes from Judaism. And I think that the, and to uh, situate that, I want to circle back to Fortune and Crowley on that point in a second, but to situate that in the modern world, you have a lot of Jews now saying like, what the hell? Like, what is Christian, quote unquote, Kabbalah? What is hermetic Kabbalah, quote unquote? Like, this is ours. You like took this and like took it out of context. And you'll see people who, I, you may have seen this, identify as Jewishes online saying like, this is all, this is not for you. This is, you've commodified our culture. And uh, so, there, well, so, so there's that kind of going on as well. And that has to be the- addressed. But the assumption of, of Hebrew uh, names is also found extensively in the Greek, uh, Greco Egyptian magical papyri, Greek magical papyri. There, they all these, these. Uh, uh, Hebrew uh, is? Oh, tons of it. Oh, I yes, didn't know they, that. Okay, interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, the Greek magical papyri is full of 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 Hebrew, um, of names derived by Hebrew, and the the Picatrix as well. I mean, overtly says the Jews call you this, right? The Romans call you this. The, the and they call you this in India. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I, was, you, I gotta go back know, and so, look at those. Interesting. So Hebrew being uh, adopted as a sacred language goes back to th- that time and and uh or and probably earlier you know of where it was being borrowed and um in the arabic speaking world we see it in in picatrix and um and and we see it in uh 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 all all kinds of stuff that that crossover and and i get it i mean the thing is is it's like um it it's it was appropriated, you know, and it was like grafted on onto a system. So I understand, you know, people being like, well, wait, you know, this is not, this is not, um, uh, uh, true. And there's a lot of rich, uh, Kabbalistic and, and Hebrew, uh, theology and lore. That's so amazing. That doesn't even figure at all into hermetic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if you really want to, like, if you consider the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri hermetic, which I kind sure. of would, yeah, yeah, yeah I because, would, yeah, for because sure, because it's a it's a crossover. Just of, academically, of, that's those are hermetic of texts. Egyptian and Greek. So there's Hebrew in there. Yeah, yeah. You know, like like uh, so it's it was happening since those times that um, you know words of power, uh, Hebrew and Sanskrit you know, uh, uh, always derived as these uh, sacred languages. Interesting. And- so I was, yeah, I got to go back and look at those. And, and that is not something that was discounted by the, not discounted, but the Greek, or the, excuse me, the Enochian angels never talk about the, about those. They're talking about the, like the medieval grimoires. I got to go back and look at those. So, um, I'm working on this meditation course right now and, I wrote up a big thing for it where I talk about the political context of the spread of yoga to the West. And the point that I make in there is that you really cannot take um, Indian teachers coming to the West and teaching people in England and America yoga. You really cannot take that outside of the political context of the British Empire and the British occupation of India and the Indian nationalist movement, because we're talking about religious exchange between two cultures where one is the occupying force. And there's a reverse, there's a reverse imperial effort to kind of whatever it was, get Western people to chill out by doing yoga, get, you know, maybe just, just, you know, uh, a lot of the logic of imperialism was that people were uneducated, savage, or even had no soul. So maybe it's as simple as saying, hey, we're human beings. Our traditions are really important and complex. And in some cases, a lot older and more complex than yours just to do cultural education. But I, but whatever it was, you, you just can't take that period with like Vivekananda coming and then Yogananda and, and so forth. You just can't take it out of context of and also theosophy and Gandhi and all of that, you can't take it outside of the context of the British Empire. In the same way, when I was looking at this and thinking about it prior to the podcast, what I realized was when you had this intense interest in Kabbalah in England, 
with the Golden Dawn, with Crow, with the with Fortune, with Crowley. I realized that it suddenly was not lost on me that when all of these English um, high society people were studying Kabbalah so inten- intensely was also the period around the creation of British mandatory Palestine. So it's it comes from the and it's also uh, also the Zionist movement was starting in England at the same time. So it can't be taken. Out. I don't think that even even as far back as Pico because the whole thrust of the Renaissance was towards Zionism. So, and Christian Zionism under Elizabeth. So I don't know if Kabbalah can be taken outside of the context of Zionism and particularly at this time period of the English establishment of what then became the state of Israel. Um, and, and I think that needs to be thought about and, and, Some writers from this period, for instance, J.F.C. Fuller explicitly talks about this in his book about Kabbalah. Um, And I think that the question has to be asked is like, is Kabbalah ultimately like an inherently perhaps Zionist pursuit in in its historical sense? Even with the Christian Kabbalah, because in in the same way now, and you look at at Fortune, she's basically a conservative Christian. In, In America, all the Christian conservatives are praising Jesus, but they want the establishment of the state of Israel so that Jesus can come back, but they don't actually care about Jewish people. And I think there's some of that going on here. I argue that in my, my D book as well. I mean, I think that there's a lot of, um, uh, crimes against, uh, humanity, uh, 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 where all these things are concerned for sure, but I can't really speak to it because my, I'm so bad with history and so bad with politics that like, I don't, I'm, I'm terrible. I don't know any of that stuff. Like I'm, I just don't, uh, I'm not educated in, in that way. You know, I'm I, like, like art and magic is, is my thing, but I, uh, I agree with you. Everything that you say sounds very astute. And I'm sure that, um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, raping and pillaging and stealing of other people's Well, to shit. be clear, I'm not, I'm not necessarily using Zionism as a pejorative. I'm using it as an academic and historical term. So I'm not just, just to make that clear, I'm saying like the literal historical Zionist movement. I'm not saying like, you know, using it as a pejorative. I'm just saying that, that there is a, there is a Zionist thrust to history, both in Christianity and in Judaism. And a lot of the Kabbalistic influence Jewish groups throughout the second millennium were explicitly Zionist. And it was the ones actually that were much, much more engaged with Kabbalah that were also beginning to posit what uh, Zionism. And that was in contradiction to previous Jewish thought. So there's a lot yeah. going on on both sides that with, related to Kabbalah and the concept of of the physical establishment of the state of Israel. So, and it's also inter- interesting to me, like we, we didn't touch on the whole like battle of Britain where like fortune is astrally fighting the Nazi forces, but you know, the outcome of world war two is the literal establishment of the state of Israel. And at that point, it's protectorship passes from uh, Britain to America. And at that point you basically see interest in the Kabbalah in the UK, at least or, compared to that period, just drop off completely. Mm. So it, it's interesting that the period of time that it was so intense was the same period that Britain had explicit protectorship of British mandated Palestine. I mean, literally they, st- I believe it was, it, it was, it was the outcome of the first world war. And I believe it was established, um, the same year that Dion Fortune joined the golden dawn, but certainly it goes back to, um, you know, th- there was such a push to establish it. And there there had been in England, even back to Elizabethan time period. And the whole point of the, the whole establishment in Amer- of America was to some extent, um, people who were fervent Zionists who were exiled to America because everyone w- was too, it was like, it was too much for the Anglican church at the time or something like that. Um, so, so, I think that has to be looked at politically. Like, can the two ultimately be divorced? And, but I do want to make clear that I'm not saying that as a pejorative. I'm saying it, and I'm not making any political statement about Israel or Zionism, and I'm not even touching that because that's such a massive issue 
on, you know, that's, that's such a hotly con- contested thing. I'm not talking about that at all or the political realities of the state of Israel now. I'm just saying Zionism as a historical term, the push to found Israel as a literal state, I don't think can be divorced from Kabbalah going back a long time. Yeah, I think that's really interesting topic, but it's definitely outside the scope of what my, my specialty, because I'm not a historian and politics is something that I do not specialize in. So that's probably a better discussion for someone else because totally. I don't. Well, well I like, guess com- like all I want to point to is that maybe it should be all I want to point to is that like these things do have historical context and all that I'm pointing to here is that you never see the top you never see any historical context discussed when you're reading books like mystical Kabbalah or hermetic Kabbalah books you never hear anything about the Kabbalistic sects sectuses sex I can never pronounce that word the Kabbalistic groups within Judaism and there's a whole history on the Jewish side that you just do not hear about at all. And I think that that does a disservice outside of people like Gershom Skolem, if that's how his name is pronounced, and, yeah. and people like that. And I really do think that that needs to be assessed. These things don't occur in a vacuum as much as hermetic writers would like you to believe. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, and that's why I tried to distinguish earlier with hermetic Kabbalah versus Hebrew Kabbalah. It's It's... You know, it was appropriated and grafted on to a, basically a Neoplatonic system. So that, you know, sure. That, but that's, I, I that's would actually that. argue that that also is inherently the same thing because it's kind of like I was saying in America, it's like Christian Zionism is a massive political force in America. You know, and just because mm-hmm. it's coming from the Christian side, it's like, you know, right wing preachers who say tell everyone to send their money to Israel and the political effort. Um, to establish Israel for the specific reason that Christians think it's part of the apocalyptic timeline and not because they care about Jewish people, unfortunately. Um, and and that I talk about that in the D book. There, none of this stuff can be divorced from that history. Yes. Well, as a Cuban American, I feel gratitude to all of the cultures uh, and uh, religious streams of thought that I have b- had the privilege to study or uh, learn from their spiritual ways. And this includes all nations, East and West, and all religions, uh, all um, uh, schools of magic and mysticism. And there's none that I uh, reject. I think it's, same, a, a same. Be- a be- it's a beautiful uh array of of um of symbols and and pantheons and and lore and uh imagery and everything that that i think all of it is sacred and all of it is holy and i i respect all of it yeah i agree absolutely absolutely um, and for me, that also includes understanding the the historical context. And I'm not I'm not saying again, I'm not saying anything to I'm not making a political statement at all. I'm just wondering about the historical the historical context around things. So, yeah. So where do we leave Dion Fortune? I mean, OK, so let me just ask you this question. Does this book stand the test of time? Should people still read it? Hmm. You know, it's funny. Uh, yes, I think maybe people should. It, it depends what they're going for. You know, I mean, there's a lot of um, good literature coming out that that uh, is is derived more from the the that is not derived more that is purely derived from the Hebrew tradition and therefore more rich. I must say, in this reading of it, I was a little bit disenchanted maybe um which is weird because when i read it like less than two years ago i think i was like oh my god whoa this is blowing my mind but maybe that's because i was in a different mode of my astrological um work at that point and i've read so many things in those past two years from all sorts of different sources much older and much um you know like like millennia old that blew my mind way more. So maybe I was at this point where I'm like, okay, it's a great springboard to be reminded of this stuff, but her tone is a little aggravating (laughs) and it's, and, and it's a little bit exclusive or quite exclusive and it's very highfalutin. And, um, 
you know, but are there not gems there? Like I said earlier, like I'm a, I'm a hoe when it comes to occult literature. I love everything. You know, I'm, I'm not going to toss this out because I'm able to derive uh, uh, inspiration and, and uh, even knowledge from it. Right. So I, I definitely find it valuable, but somebody just yesterday asked me, what's a good book that if I want to learn more about Kabbalah and I, 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 I wasn't going to recommend this. Interesting. You know? Okay. Yeah. So then, yeah, because I agree with you. It was, it's, it's a little bit disenchanting reading it now. Um, I remember it when I first read it when I was, I think 19 or 20, just being overwhelmed by it and thinking like, how can I ever possibly understand this? Because I was coming at it from the chaos magic perspective where it's like, okay, do I need to literally invoke every single one of the things she's talking about to understand it? And is, is she like such a masterful magician that she's like in a castle with people like doing all this stuff, talking to the angel Metatron and all this stuff. But yeah, now when I read it, it's, and I understand, uh, uh, you know, more of this concept context of when it was written, why it was written, what she was doing, who she was, um, and particularly all the stuff at the racist stuff at the beginning. Um, not so in, not so, um, impressive, I think, but, but still, yeah. but you can't throw out Dion Fortune. I mean, she wrote great books. She wrote so many books and she was such a clear and level headed writer in other regards, not necessarily in the racial aspects, not in her like psychic paranoia but in a lot of other aspects she's a really good writer and it's interesting that she's traditionally has be, been considered the safe path in magic as opposed to like crowley spare or chaos magic there's kind of been this attitude that well if you go the Dion fortune way it's you can't really go too wrong um so i guess but i guess the question now is not would you still recommend it to to people but would you recommend it to beginners and it sounds like no and I'm wondering what you would recommend to people instead. As an astrologer and uh, a tarot practitioner, it's for me always, um, uh, I guess you could say, nourishing to get uh, to revisit hermetic uh, material from whatever era, you know, um, as far as that goes. I mean, honestly, Gershom Sholem. Like that's the, that's the, that's the, uh, scholarly, uh, uh, um, you know, pretty much standard, you know, I mean, Francis Yates, uh, uh, her knowledge of, of Kabbalah, all that stuff. She doesn't know Kabbalah. She always refers to, to Gershom Sholem, you know, Kabbalah. so, so it's it's, great (laughs) because, because Sholem is, is the scholarly, um, uh what do you call that like authority I yeah suppose, yeah he is on on this stuff so there are what would you recommend are, that he wrote uh major trends in jewish mysticism okay and he he also wrote a commentary on the sefer yetzira uh, i will and that that's the thing i mean the original kabbalistic literature right the the sefer yetzira the the uh the the the, the talmud the uh, uh the, this uh, original uh literature is what is what uh uh, you know, this way you're not getting somebody's take on it. Right. Right. You know right. What I right. Mean? Like that's so the, important. The, yeah. l- like the Zohar is, is like, a is that's, it's, it's like a, it's like a puzzle game, you know, like that's, that, that's, that's what it's supposed to be. Something that you're supposed to engage with and, and contemplate, you know, the, uh, um, the, the numerical systems and stuff. So yeah, like the Zohar, the Sefer Yetzirah, the, um, uh, uh, and then it, that's if you want the direct experience. And then if you want the scholarly approach, it would be Gershom Sholem. This yeah, thing, I so. agree with that. I, I think the whole thing is in Sefer, the Sefer Yetzirah, you know, in, in, in seed form. I mean, it's like, that's the basic equation right there. Yeah. Well then there's all sorts of other, like, you know, then, then you get all like, uh, 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 I, I mean, the Zohar has all those complex and see, that's what teaches you that like, you're, you're not supposed to, it's not supposed to be a brick of knowledge. It's supposed to be a mind a, a spiritual exercise or a mental exercise of contemplation, you know, and, and that's what you get from uh, Zohar. And then there's like, and like, 
I mean, there's all kinds of, of uh, amazing theology and lore about all the different veils of existence. And the, uh, there's this book called Legends of the Jews that's like a compendium of, of like, I guess you might say non-canonical uh, lore that's really fascinating about, you know, it's mythology. Essentially, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of sources, but yeah, I mean, go into the original stuff and, uh, or the scholarly stuff, depending what you're looking for. If it's a spiritual experience or, or, or a spiritual kind of engagement or a scholarly, one, you know? Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I don't think anyone would argue with that. And that's really good to point out. And that is one of the real gifts of our age, which I know that the kind of grimoire purist movement has touched upon is we just have much better and much better academic sources now um, that they didn't have before. So it's like now, instead of reading Dion Fortune, you can go and read that stuff, right? It's like you can go to academic peer-reviewed sources. There's been so much good academic work on not just this, but, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, the Eastern traditions, you know, and it's like, like I would recommend to, to people, if you really want to learn this stuff, like flee from occult books, for sure. I mean, you're going to get way better information from academic scholarly works. Um, so, but, but I like the occult books too, obviously it's just, you'll get, yeah, better, you'll I, get better quality. Inform- that's something Phil Hine told me a long time ago and he was right. It's like, you'll get better quality information from academic press books. Yeah. And well, academia has its own inertia oh, and its sure. own, and its own, uh, yeah, you're not going to um, get like stories of people practicing this stuff, but you'll get good historical information. Yeah, it it has its own barriers. I I might I might say, but yeah, but yeah. it depends. Okay, for me as somebody who came into magic when I did, and and the 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 schema of of the tree of life was so such an played such an essential role. And I would argue that if I, I stu- practicing as a traditional astrologer, if my roots are in Alexandrian uh literature which is hermetic okay uh uh at that period which it is and and greek uh and this extends of course through persia and 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 the arabic speaking world and all this stuff um then anything that falls within that hermetic window uh is is something that inspire i find inspiring but it might not be for everyone other people might not have the same filing system that that was so entrenched at the time that um that i was developing magically you know yeah no i agree we, we both came through the the chaos magic era also where like it, it, the basic approach for people was to just reject all of this anyways so that's definitely changed yeah and it was imp- it was impossible to avoid this stuff back yeah. then yeah you know yeah, I, I, I always felt it was, I al- al- always felt and still do feel that it is just, disin- if you're going to be into magic, it is just disingenuous to not engage with Kabbalah. I mean, it's, it's been a huge um, inspiration for me. If, if anything, I'd have to say a, a huge foundation uh for me i I can't imagine functioning without it absolutely yeah Yeah. all right well we've been talking for two hours and 35 minutes so maybe we should maybe we should put a put a bookmark in it for now all right well this has been awesome thanks so much yeah thank you it was great to re- revisit the book and, you know, even all these points you brought up about like, okay, does it hold up? What are the problems? Like, you know, does the, does the golden dawn tradition, like, like what can it offer us still? And in what oh, ways yeah. is, it, is it no longer really operative? You know, so it's, 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 it's a good thing to talk about. Well, that's a, that, yeah, that is a even broader question. I mean, yeah, it's I'm now that I'm thinking about it, like that's kind of sad actually. It's a little bit I feel a bit sad about this. It's like, you know, this has been co- one of the primary go-to books and now I think we both agree. It's like I would not hand this to somebody uh just the, from the opening kind of, you know, race diatribe alone. It's like it, it totally is going to give somebody the wrong idea and that's kind of the end of an era in a way. Um and it also shows how much our culture has changed. Where I remember when I first read it in like 2002 or 2001, 
like I remember being like my I remember that stuff and just being like, well, this is weird and old. But now I think if somebody and I, I guess people just thought like that back then. But now I think if somebody read this, they would just like have a swell up and have an allergic reaction and be like, what is this? Um, it's it's very abrasive. Yeah. And it was way more abrasive to me this time when I looked at it. Um, and so maybe, and again, with the psychic paranoia and things like that, it's like maybe Dion Fortune is a little less relevant now. Um, Golden Dawn, I think will never be not relevant, but. Well, I, well, yeah, because the Golden Dawn was a synthesis, like a, it's our first, it's our first, uh, real available synthesis of yeah. all this hermetic material which yeah. includes enochian magic yeah. and inc- and includes uh uh tantric yoga t- uh, t- to a degree at least the tattvas and and these kinds of uh meditations and and stuff like that it, it was a synthesis of occult information that was very all encompassing and they definitely my, got Look, if you're dealing with a system that big and drawn from so many sources, from so many cultures, you're not going to get it all right. And there's things that you're going to omit and there's things that you're going to bastardize. Yeah, and they just didn't have access to as much information as we do now. But but they still did have access to quite a lot, you know, so so if you're on that trajectory at least of if you appreciate even renaissance magic and and that kind of stuff that was happening then the golden dawn is is uh uh a consolidation of that and even a little bit more far-reaching and if you want to go outside of that altogether that's another story yeah but at least at least as far as the hermetic tradition goes yeah you can't you can't you can't skip over the golden dawn no i agree and and i think that Mathers got a lot more right than he got wrong by a big margin. Like he got a lot right and he did get some things wrong, but he got a lot more right. And the scholarly feat of putting that thing together is possibly like the biggest deal in the entire history of the tradition. Like it's just a phenomenal work of creative scholarship. And if he took creative liberties, well, guess what? It's the same as like with Crowley or Fortune. We can build on their successes and improve on and learn from their failures. But that was a tremendous scaffolding that was built. And it's interesting in the computer programming world, there is a phrase, there are two types of computer languages, the kind that people complain about and the kind that people don't use. And I think that's kind of the deal with the Golden Dawn. Yeah. Yeah. It'll always, um, uh, it'll, it'll always be a, 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 a strong framework for me, for sure. Me, me, me as well. Absolutely. I think it's a, it was phenomenal, phenomenal piece of, um, phenomenal work. I think it, it was just Mathers, right? Well, it was Mathers, Westcott, and uh, uh, W.N. Westcott, Samuel Little McGregor Mathers. Wasn't there a third? There person? was a third. Um, and uh, yeah. I'll tell you who it is. I'm, I'm blanking, but I normally know this person's name. W.N. Westcott, McGregor Mathers. Who was the other one? I, 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 uh, I feel like a jerk. But anyways, they claimed that it came from some uh, Anna Sprengel, right? Like the Golden right. Dawn was was not absolved of saying that their material came from Ascended Masters. Actually, could, I think, do you want to weigh in on that? What? Yeah, the whole thing about the Cypher manuscript, you were telling me something about that. Oh, yeah. You yeah, can... let me, Dan, Danny is going to, was telling me something about this, so. Danny, please. <laughs> Um, if you look at the Wikipedia article for that, you uh, there's there's a lot of contention that a lot of people think that they were uh, basically made up in the same way that H.P. Blavatsky said that she received the the stanzas of Dizion from the Ascended Masters, um, which plays into uh, a lot of scholarly contention, which especially even if you look at the Ascended Masters, they were all uh, white and male for the most part that she was drawing from. I, I don't believe all of them are, but especially the cipher manuscripts, they have no purported date and then there's no other uh, academic relation to anything else. And especially um, you can trace a lot of that back to a text like the PGM where a lot of very similar rituals tend to show up. 
content. Yes. And uh, I will say that anything that claims to come from a supernatural entity or an ascended master, I'm automatically going to be suspicious of. For sure. But I will definitely say that a lot of the material was derived from esoteric Freemasonry. And yes. That yeah. Way, they, that all were, they all were esoteric Freemasons that were kicked out because they wanted uh, co-masonry. They wanted women in the order. Yeah, that much that much we do know that a lot of the framework and including uh, the grade system. Yeah, 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 was, yeah. That that came from masonry, and then there's there's legends and lore that it was preserved in Freemasonry through the Knights Templar and and all of these uh, secret organizations and stuff. So I highly you know, doubt and, that. And uh, you know the Rosicrucians and and um, and and all of this. So so filtered filtered into Freemasonry somehow, whichever yeah. way it was. I mean, I, mean, I, then, mean, I make the, the argument like very, I think, I, I, pretty extensively in the D book that the source is actually D and the angelic records and that went into Rosicrucianism, which became Freemasonry. Um, huh. So, because, and it comes from their time on the continent in Prague, spreading what the angels said. And uh, I, I think that directly goes into obviously that directly goes into freemasonry and a lot of other stuff but um yeah golden dawn i think i'm i I can't remember the name of the third one uh but if i'm remembering correctly i think it was mathers that did all the actual scholarly work and the others probably helped putting it together and organizing it but i think it was mathers that actually made the system i could be wrong I i know mathers did a lot of the um uh historical grafting Right, probably on to some sort of existing Masonic, uh, 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 right, grade system or, yeah. or, the, uh, the Masonic for, Rosicrucians. Right, formula, right, because Rosicrucianism, again, which, which, uh, there, there's no proof at all that Rosicrucianism was ever an operative order or right. an actual group group right. of people. Right. Right. It it was a series of manifestos and a series of, of philosophical yeah. and spiritual outpouring. But as far as a Rosicrucian brotherhood actually existing, it may there, never have. Yeah. It, it probably never did. But the but idea was, was so potent that it changed Europe, the course of European history. I believe that Rosicrucianism did filter into M- M- Freemasonry yeah. and, and that, uh, and that the golden dawn was an effort of extracting the, the, the Rosicrucian, if you like, sl- slash hermetic, uh, elements of Freemasonry and emphasizing those over the various, you know, philanthropic and social, uh, emphases yeah. that, that all the, all the, Masonic lodges of the world yeah, yeah. Uh, put put forward above that stuff. Right. You know, right, a lot of right. Masonic lodges aren't don't 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 aren't interested in anything uh, occult or metaphysical necessarily. So so For they sure. wanted to to isolate that within a structure. And yeah, it definitely. It definitely came out of that. For for me, Freemasonry, Golden Dawn, AA are all part of the are all this part of the spectrum of one tradition. Like it's all one, it's all one thing, you know. At, um, the, uh, with, yeah, but they borrowed from so many external traditions. Though, oh no, no, so no, no, no like, for sure, for sure, right? But in terms of like what, like the orders that uphold the Western esoteric tradition, and I think there is a clear progression there of you know learning free, you know, going through free, Freemason. Like everyone in the Golden Dawn was pre- like many of them had already gone through Freemasonry, so it was very much like a next step, and. For me, they they it just is one system, is maybe yeah. a better way of putting it. Well, because you know you like there's there's in in the West there's always an interruption to any of these developments, yeah. right? At that like like you have the Hellenistic system that falls apart at the uh, Dark Ages, and and you know and then but then uh, thank God it was sustained in the Arabic speaking world, and then the legend is that the Templars, right, through through the Crusades, through some. Uh, um, uh, contact with uh, the, the is Islamic uh, or uh, 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 
preservers of, of this knowledge basically absorbed it and maintained it in, again, this is lore, but maintained it in secret societies that filtered into Freemasonry and then Rosicrucianism, uh, did the same. And then, and I don't know where Enochian, uh, I, I know where Enochian happened, but I don't know where it filtered into Masonry or Rosicrucianism or whatever. If it was just, I, it went pro- from, from D's work in Prague to the Rosicrucian manifestos were based oh, okay. on his work. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, and yeah. then, and then also th- like, like there would be no Enochian without the Kabbalistic right. inspiration because, right. or the Grimoires or the Grimoires, there would not have been Enochian, you know, yes, so, yes, yeah, or Agrippa. Yeah. Right. Because that formed yeah. the matrix from which, from which the, you know, the great John D, the great genius, you know, put it together. So I think, yeah, that is one thing for unfortunate or not about the Western tradition that is just not the case with the Eastern traditions. Like you go over there and they've been an unbroken practice for 10,000 years. There weren't interruptions. And so that's why we have, you know, it falls to us in such a way to like continue building upon what we have and not reject anything and continue um, putting back, reassembling the system and reassembling a tradition where before there was none because it was destroyed by the church. So we're all doing that. And, and I, I, we, we all, we have, we have the work of some really, really bright people to build on D Crowley, Dion fortune, Austin spare in his own odd way, you know, Mathers for sure. Like all of these people, it's like, we, we, we have some really bright people who have assisted with this, but it's, it's an ongoing effort to put it together. And, yeah. um, and, and the original sources, whatever original yeah, sources we, yeah. we can get, right. Yeah, whatever so like, we can get. Right. Yeah. You know, Hermes Trismegistus, uh, uh, Pet Osiris, uh, the, the Greek magical papyri, the, the, uh, Al, Al-Kindi, right. Picatrix, yeah. like, like all, all this stuff, like, like whatever, um, uh, wherever it can be gleaned, you know, that's why I, it's, I speak in gratitude to all these oh, different I agree. cultures and all these different traditions that, that kept it alive in whatever inflection they did, because in, we get to, and of, and of course, uh, especially with astrology, you have, uh, India that where it has never, uh, they, they have a right. chain of astrological. Yeah. They still uh, arrange marriages on that, based that, on that has, <laughs> that, that, that has never ceased there. Right. So, so the, the, the privilege, right. To learn from, uh, Absolutely. the world Absolutely. and, and to not reject or, or, um, uh, negate is, is a wonderful thing that I'm grateful for. Yeah, I agree with you. And, 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 but I also, or, and I also say it's an ongoing, the tr- tr- quote unquote tradition is, is it's not a tradition in the sense of like the traditionalists like Evola and Ganon, like saying there's something we have to get back to that's perfect. Although D might have argued otherwise, but I think that it's an ongoing living, breathing thing that is just oh, been yeah. the ongoing process of developing. And so, yeah, it continues to expand itself and it continues to reveal itself. And yeah, revealing uh, is a good way of putting it. I like that through, through whatever lens is available. And that's why I will all, always be open, you know, and always be grateful for, for whatever comes my way. Any, any magic, any occult tradition, any, uh, lore or mythology or whatever it is, I'm, I'm so grateful for. And I want, I want to pin it to my tree. You know yeah. what I mean? No, that's a good way of putting it. That, that's what the Kabbalah is so great, great for. I remember when I was really deep in studying Kabbalah and Anokian in the early 2000s. I often said it's like assembling an alien space. It's like reassembling a crashed alien spacecraft with no instructions. That's what it feels like sometimes. It's like putting together an alien artifact that you don't understand. So maybe we should. Yeah, it's now two two hours and fifty minutes. I'm dying here. Uh, All let's, right, let's talk been, again. We've... Let's talk again soon. We'll, just we'll talk it. again soon. Thank okay. you so much thank for you, having Mickey. me on. This has been so great. And thank you, Danny, for your contributions and your help and, and everything. Thank you, Mickey. Okay. Talk to you soon. All right. All right. Bye. All right. Hope you really, really enjoyed that. Join us at magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. And check out our free course, 
Why Magic? Start here. Check out our brand new Introduction to Magic course, the greatest course on magic ever made, at least on the internet. And pretty soon we're going to have a brand new course on mastering meditation that's happening very soon. Of course, we've got almost 20 other courses at that site. Everything you could possibly want to know in the broad field of world uh, world spirituality, you will find there. All right, magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. Subscribe to the podcast. Check out our YouTube. It's just Magic Me on YouTube. Like and subscribe. Tell your friends about it. And I will see you next time. Lots of love.